Great, thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, members of the authority. Um, I come here today, you know, to represent the entire community of, of Maryland sportsmen. Um, as Mr. Paul said, my name is David Richardson. I'm the executive director of the Maryland Urban Horsemen's Association. Uh, I've had that position since 2011, and uh, but I've been involved in Maryland racing my whole life since I was a teenager. Uh, and just like scores of other people in the industry, you know, I'm totally reliant on the vitality of the Maryland racing industry for my livelihood. This is what I've done my whole life. Um, I have with me Tim Keefe. Um, Tim's our president. He's a trainer that's won over 600 races, including a grade two stakes winner, still having fun. And my favorite all-time horse, a too fast to catch, Tim trained. Uh, he was a brilliant uh, racing Maryland legend. Uh, Tim's an owner, a trainer, a breeder. Owns a farm in uh, Montgomery County as well, and he's active in all aspects of the of the industry. And as Mr. Cross said, also with us is Alan Foreman. I don't think he needs an introduction. You know, Alan really is Maryland racing. He's not only you know vital to what we do with MTHA, but he's a trusted and respected voice throughout the whole industry, you know, worldwide. Uh, he's been representing the Maryland Thoroughbred Horsemen over 40 years, correct, Alan? It's been, been a long time, so, so we're thrilled to have Alan here. Um, you know, as the horsemen, there's a few horsemen on the authority here, as, um, as the horsemen know, one of the most important things for our industry is really stability and predictability. And uh, that was really a key theme in the 10-year deal that just expired at the end of last year. Um, it's something we've really struggled with obtaining as an industry for decades. And it's something we're looking to the authority for help with moving forward into the next 30 years. Uh, the men and women in this industry to wake up at 3 a.m. every day, who we represent and the breeders represent collectively, dedicated their lives because they believe not only in the legacy of you know what horse racing needs in Maryland, but the benefits of what horse racing can bring to Maryland uh, for now and decades to come. Um, what our horsemen really need moving forward is a continued partnership with the state of Maryland. That's really vital. That's vital in our survival. But also, we need a fully invested operating partner in Maryland Racing to ensure that we can survive. Uh, Maryland Racing, um, we re the horsemen, we respectfully disagree with the vision that was laid out here last week. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I was talking to... Just I'm different. sorry to interrupt you. I just want to make sure we're recording this. Sure. We are recording. Thanks. I, did, I apologize. Sure. Yeah, no problem. But I didn't want you were doing a very great job. And I was, <laughs> I <got captured. laughs> no, as, as Greg and I were talking before the meeting, um, you know, so many people have come up to me and it, it's amazing how how much word gets around. You know, there's, as we always said, as our horsemen know, there's no secrets on the backstretch. You'd be amazed at how much the, the presentation last week resonated with our horsemen and how scared they are uh, when they start to hear that you know, racing is going to contract. And the, the question that I got was, you know, where's my home going to be? You know, where are we going to race? And it's it's really, it, it, was, um, it, it was incredible how many people listened to that presentation last week. But, um, you know, we respectfully disagree with the vision that was laid out last week. Uh, Maryland Racing simply can't afford to slash racing dates so dramatically um, and increase the already massive subsidies to the current operator and hope to maintain the owners, trainers, breeders that have remained committed to our industry. A racing future as proposed last week would push trainers like Tim and breeders that the MHBA represents out of business or elsewhere. Um, additional unprecedented subsidies from the racing and breeding communities would further degrade Maryland purses shrink Maryland's breeding program and severely limit the vast community initiatives that you'll learn about later uh, that our workforce depends on for their daily lives. Uh, years ago, the General Assembly entrusted Maryland horsemen with dedicated funds to support this industry for a reason. The General Assembly believed Maryland horsemen were better positioned to make decisions in the best interest of Maryland, to grow the industry and to cultivate a better future for our horsemen and for our breeders. We look to you guys in this room, you know, the members of the authority, to help our industry to articulate a much needed new vision for what will sustain us for the next 30 years. Today, we're here to offer some thoughts for what we think that vision should be um, on the ground every day. Moving forward, you'll see what we need. It, it, it's really very simple. We, we don't really have a complicated set of needs. Uh, we need safe facilities uh, that safe racetracks. We need 
good housing for our, for our workers. Uh, we need year-round stabling for at least 1,400 horses. We need room to grow. We need space. Uh, we also need a, a, a robust collaborative racing schedule. And we also need financial stability for, um, uh, for a full and fully engaged local management, which we don't believe we've had. And we also need an openness for innovative new revenue streams. So first, let me explain. Um, I think it's important to say, you know, why does the horse industry matter? So we did a little presentation here. <clears throat> so the horse racing industry, there's in the horse industry, there's 28,000 Maryland jobs. Now, that's a huge, huge industry. And a lot of people think that the horse racing industry or horse racing is just what happens uh, during racing or during the race days, kind of like the Orioles or the Ravens, it just happens and it, and it goes away. And that's that's not the case in the horse racing industry. Um, the horse industry generates 80 plus million dollars of tax revenue in the horse state. And that's that's astounding. It's, it's really a, a huge, huge number. And we have over a 2.1 billion dollar annual economic impact for the state of Maryland. And also a big part of our industry is agriculture, um, the open space. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that 25% of the state's agricultural land is devoted to horses. Um, there's more horses per square mile than any other state in, in, the, in the nation here in Maryland. Um, also, who is the horse racing industry? The horse racing industry, we represent MTHA. There's 3,000 active owners and trainers at any time in, in the state of Maryland every single year. Um, so that's, that's a, a, a huge number, but that's only a small little piece. There's also over 2,000 backstretch workers. And a backstretch worker is a groom, a hot walker, an exercise rider, an assistant trainer. Uh, and there's also a massive amount of other members of our community, from jockeys to farriers to equine dentists to feed companies. You'll see the list goes on and on and on as to the people, um, people that are in this industry. Um, so with that said, I want to introduce our president, uh, our longtime president, Mr. Tim Kinu. He's going to give you kind of a, a good perspective of, of what it's like uh, and how the business works in, in thoroughbred horse racing, and especially from his perspective as a trainer of one of close to 200 trainers in the state. So, Tim. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the authority. Appreciate you having the time, taking the time to hear us today. So as David said, my name is Tim Keefe. I'm the firm president of the Maryland Thoroughbred Horsemen's Association. It's a title in which I've held for the last nine years, been on the board of directors for 15 years. I'm the past president and current board member of the Maryland Thoroughbred Horsemen's, uh, Maryland Thoroughbred Assistance Foundation. I'm also the past vice president and board member of the Maryland Million. Uh, and I was one of 16 individuals chosen by HISA to sit on their HISA advisory board. I was born in Maryland. Raised in Maryland, educated at the University of Maryland and College Park, where I graduated with my business economic degree. I'm married, and with my wife, Ramsey, we operate and own Avalon Farm in Sandy Spring, Maryland, where we've raised four kids. And uh, currently, we have two broodmares that we breed to race. When I was 15, I got my first job out at the racetrack walking hots on the weekends for Frank Calvo. At 18, I was galloping out there, put myself through college. And as much as I can't believe, it's been 30 years since I saddled my first horse um, back in 1993. So I've been doing it quite a while. We currently have roughly 1,200 horses on the backside between Laurel and Pimlico. That number fluctuates, but I'll use the number 1,200 because that's typically what we'll have. It's not including the Fair Hill or some of the private farms. I'm going to briefly describe how the money flows into the racing economy from uh, between the owner and the trainer relationship. As I said, I'm a licensed trainer. I'm about one of 200 that are licensed individuals that make a living training race horses in the state of Maryland. The average investment cost of a two-year-old when it arrives to the racetrack is $45,000. 1,200 horses times 45,000 is approximately $54 million in resources that owners have in these race horses. The average racing career of a racehorse is anywhere from two to three years. So that every second and third year, that money keeps continually being reinvested into this economy to keep the supply of the racehorses coming in. The average cost to train a racehorse per month is roughly $3,500. You add to $3,500 times 1,200 12, horses, you're looking at each month 
owners putting out between 4.2, roughly $4.2 million or $60 million in expenses to training and tra training related expenses. Cost is so high because training a racehorse is very labor intensive. For instance, in my and my stable, well, my ratio owner to, or I'm sorry, employee to horse ratio is one to two. So every two horses, I have an employee. I have a barn full of 40 horses, which means I have a staff of 40. 70 to 75% of my income is used for payroll, payroll related expenses, um, salaries, workers' compensation, and payroll taxes. The rest of the money is go to a lot of all these things that you see up there. It goes to the feed, the hay, the straw, the um, veterinarians, the um, assistants, blacksmiths, all different, uh, all different avenues where these monies are going. Um, obviously, the objective is to get these horses to the races. It's to give them racing opportunities to earn purse monies so that these racing opportunities give owners the abilities to earn purse monies to help cover these expenses. As I said earlier, the, the average career of a racehorse is two to three years. And when that racehorse is, is retired, it doesn't mean that its economic benefit to the state's finished. Uh, every single racehorse that retires has a second career, whether it's a fox hunter, a show horse, trail horse, whatever it may be. Maryland has a robust horse industry that's fueled in part by retired racehorses. So again, their economic benefit to the state continues far beyond their time at the racetrack. These purses also fuel our organization's robust community support initiatives as well. The MTHA, at the MTHA, we've done some remarkable things for our workforce and for our community as a whole. So with that, I think I'd like to pass it back to David and let him highlight some of the efforts that we've had at the MTHA for our community. Um, first, let me talk about, as Tim said, that purse money itself really supports our industry and that that's really one of our biggest jobs is to really you know take care of our industry our workforce and uh, a few years ago when tim took over as president you know we had a challenge we wanted to provide health care for our workforce we had to figure out a way but as tim said i mean there's hundreds and hundreds of almost thousands of people that we represent that work at the racetrack so we had to really think creatively and, and what do we do you know because the cost of providing health insurance for our workforce was in the tens of millions of dollars. It just wasn't practical. So, so we started to think a little bit differently and um, out of that came the horse and health system. That, that's probably one of our most proud initiatives that we do for, for our workforce. And um, <clears throat> we, we took one of the most advanced health systems and brought it into the our office itself. We, we gutted our offices at Laurel and Pimlico and turned it into a primary care, free primary care facility for our, for our workforce. So for those of you that have been in the, the MTHA office, it looks everything like a, like a doctor's office. Uh, we found that our, our, our workers, our backstretch workers, they're so dedicated to our industry and to our horses, they don't like to leave the racetrack. They, they live at the racetrack, their home is there. They're so devoted, they don't want to leave, even to take care of themselves. So what we did, we brought the doctor's office to them. Uh, you know, we partnered with, with MedStar Health and, you know, we created a whole robust system, you know, that has um, free primary care. It's a free primary care system with medical records, everything that you have in your personal private uh, primary care office, we have free of charge for, for, horse, uh, for members of the horse racing community. It's really astounding. Um, it's directly in the, the MTHA offices. We have over 600 active patients, you know, it, it's, it's really, um, it's astounding how many people flow in and out of that office and how many lives have been saved over the past eight years from this um, uh, Horseman's Health System. We also, it's also supported by our, our really robust benevolence program. So let's say you break your arm and you have to go, you, you need care that's beyond what you can do in a primary <clears throat> care facility. We keep um, we, we keep the patient within the MedStar Health System through our benevolence program, and there's little to no cost for really any medical care for our workers, which is really unprecedented throughout the, the industry. And what would have cost us tens of millions of dollars to do through private third-party health insurance, we do for under a million dollars. It's it's really astounding that we have our own contained medical system all at the racetrack. And what other medical, what other industry, what other racing industry in this in the country does? That? None. I mean, None. we've had all we've With had industries ones. come to to take a look at our system to see exactly how we do this, and it's just something we in, 
I'm sure it's somewhere, but it's something we had to do based on need because we, you know, we, we care about our, our industry. Um, but with that, we also, it, it, it's, it's a broader initiative. Uh, right there is our medical director with our jockeys. Uh, we have world-class jockey care with that as well. Uh, the horse racing industry really lagged behind other professional support, or other professional supports in their head injury uh, treatments. There was really no care for head injury concussion protocols. And we, uh, through our horseman's health system, really pioneered uh, head injury protocols, concussion treatment, really even before the NFL did. You know, the NFL, a few years after we started what we were doing, really took it on the, the nose because they weren't focused on head injuries and, you know, uh, concussions. And I think they finally caught up. But we were we were actually ahead of the NFL in the, the um, you know, the care that we give our jockeys. And we really think it's world class. Uh, just this week, that's the, the MedStar van is coming to our, our uh, facility. Uh, it comes three, four times a year. We do preventative care, health screenings, colonoscopy, you name it, everything we provide to our, uh, our community free of charge. But other benefits that we provide as um, part of the, the MTHA to our community. And also dental care. Um, we noticed when the uh, horsemen would come in, we noticed that they weren't quite taking care of their teeth. We needed root canals and crowns and whatnot. So we partnered with an organization in Silver Spring. We bring in medical uh, dental units. We bring in two dental vans into the backstretch uh, and do cleanings and root canals and caps and you name it. And it's all, uh, for the most part, free of charge for, for horsemen. Uh, provide eye care, um, as I said, preventative care, cancer screenings, uh, we also have a prescription plan. And, um, you know, we have a health, as I said, our health fair is this coming Tuesday, our, our fall health fair, where we get flu shots, COVID shots, you name it, that we, we take care of our people. Uh, and there's so much more. I mean, it's, we could be here all day talking about this. But um, in addition, we don't only care about their health, but we also care about their future, too. Um, we have a fully funded factory pension plan for our people. Um, it has over 600 participants in it. It's fully funded. Um, it has over $9 million of assets been in place since the 80s. And it's really a meaningful benefit as a worker for the industry. You, if you see now in other industries, there's 401ks and pension plans don't really exist much anymore, but we, you know, the MTHA really believes in our people. We don't believe in taking benefits away. We really believe in taking care of our people because they're the people that take care of our industry. So um, other services we provide, we have a drug and alcohol counselor on, on staff. Um, we have a full robust recreation program. We have two, two bands that take this week we took people to um to the smithsonian museum that people uh, we took a group to go see the the pandas leaving at the national zoo so we really are engaged with our community um we also have a jockeys workers compensation program that's we're really one of the only states racing states in the nation that uh has a jockeys workers compensation insurance even though we don't represent jockeys per se jockeys are part of our community we really believe in, in investing in our community uh, this is a, a program that costs us over a million dollars a year, but it shows our dedication to uh, our jockeys, or the jockeys' welfare. And um, in, in many states, Alan can tell you, in many states, the jockeys are really, they're independent contractors. They get hurt there for the most part. They're on their own. Uh, in Maryland, they're covered by the uh, Jockeys Workers Compensation Program. So we also have a burial and bereavement program to support the families. And we have tons and tons of other other services. So so the narrative is we really do care about our community, and, and it's important for us to take care of our take care of our. So so moving forward, I want to introduce I'm going to throw it to Alan. Alan can give a good history of how we got to where we are, and uh, so I think Tim and I told told you who we are, and Alan can give you a good history lesson as to how we got here. So Alan, well, thanks, um, David and Tim. Um, I have to tell you at the outset, and, and separate and apart from whatever we're doing, um, I take great pride when I hear David and I hear Tim talk uh, about this racing community in Maryland because I do my work all over the country, and the Maryland racing community is is astonishing, quite frankly. They've been resilient. They've been faced with many hardship changes, um, up moments, down moments, uh, but they continue to stand by Maryland racing and. Um, Obviously, we're at crossroads now. Another one of those um, 
very important moments, but it cannot be lost on anyone that the workforce at our tracks, the people who are connected with our business are the backbone of Maryland racing. And without them, we would not have racing. Um, I've had the privilege for 40 years now, over 40 years, to work intimately with the Maryland racing community. And the point there isn't to uh, pat myself on the back, it is to basically tell you that I've been in the trenches and I've seen everything that has happened here over the past 40 years. I've been involved in everything that has happened over the past 40 years. I've had the high moments and I've had the low moments and um, feel a tremendous obligation at this point in time to help to point the industry uh, towards its future. There's a suggestion that's been made that we shouldn't talk about the past. The past is not important, that we should just look to the future. Um, we beg to disagree. We think history is important and we think it's instructive, particularly at this critical stage for the industry. So I want to give you a, um, a brief history, which I think you will find very helpful. So I want to go back to um, when I came into the business in 1975, there were four racetracks operating in Maryland and we ran a total of 220 days of live racing. Um, you had Laurel, Pimlico, Bowie, and Timonium. At the time, Timonium was running 42 days in the summer. Laurel would run in the fall. Billy was the winter destination, and Pimlico was the spring uh, into the summer meet that um, obviously was the Christmas meet. Um, <clears throat> and as the industry changed, and, and they operated as a circuit. So Laurel would operate its days, and then the horsemen would move to Bowie. Then they'd move to Pimlico, and then they would be at Timonium. And um, it's instructive from the standpoint that when you heard last week, for example, about boutique meets and how well they're doing, in Kentucky, they have five racetracks where the horsemen move from track to track. So Churchill essentially runs a boutique meet at Ellis Park, runs a boutique meet uh, Turfway, runs a boutique meet Keelan, runs two boutique meets. But all that money is generated in the state of Kentucky. It stays in the state of Kentucky. New York is similar. You have Belmont Park, you have Aqueduct, and uh, Saratoga. Those horsemen primarily stay, move within the state, have a full year round of racing, and that is their circuit. Uh, that was what Maryland was. And that began to change when Frank DeFrancis and the Mathusos acquired Laurel and Pimlico and began a consolidation of Maryland racing. Not, not an unnecessary consolidation, but at the time, there was no simulcasting. We lived off of our mutual handle, and the notion of simulcasting was just coming onto the scene. For those of you not familiar with simulcasting, it's the betting at the racetrack via a television screen where you would see a race being run in another state, and you could bet you could bet on a race in another state, not just in Maryland. And uh, people from out of state could see the Maryland signal on, on a race in Maryland. That was the first big change, but the also other big change was that the lottery was legalized. And for the first time, racing, which was the third uh, most popular sport in the United States, started to see challenges from gaming competition. And this was the state actually going into competition with its own state racing industry. But Frank DeFrancis, the Manfusos, acquired um, Laurel and Pimlico in 1984, and they operated Bowie as a training center. And Bowie ceased to um, run live racing. Uh, Frank died in 1989 and um, ownership of the tracks, the Mafusos left and ownership was assumed by Joe DeFrancis and his sister Karen. And the game plan at that time was that Maryland was getting severely strangled by the legalization of gaming uh, in Delaware, West Virginia uh, and elsewhere and Maryland was beginning to feel the crunch that it could not compete with the neighboring states and needed an infusion of revenue. And so what began was a 10 year, ultimately became a 10 year campaign with the legislature to legalize gaming at our racetracks. Um, it didn't happen um, in Frank's era. Um, the DeFrancis family in 2002 sold a minority interest to Frank Stronach, Magnet International. Frank paid a substantial amount of money for these two tracks. Um, and he came in and said that he wanted to revolutionize horse racing, that um, he wanted to improve facilities. He wanted 
to improve the back stretches. He wanted to improve the racing surfaces, but he had no interest in gaming whatsoever, which really caught the industry off guard and put us in a diff very difficult position. Um, <clears throat> in 2007, uh, Stronach acquired a majority interest in Laurel and Pimlico and the Bowie Training Center. And the industry continued to fight for the legalization of, of gaming at our racetracks. And in 2008, the Maryland legislature legalized a BLT gaming at five locations in the state, one of which was a territory that was carved out for Laurel, but did not specifically name Laurel as a destination site. And so um, in 2009, applications were filed for gaming licenses and Frank Stronach applied for a license, had just put Magna, his company, into Chapter 11. He filed his application on February the 9th, and he failed to accompany his application with the application fee of the deposit if he were to be awarded a license. Um, uh, Dave Cordish, Cordish Companies, which had a piece of property within the territory that I think the legislature thought the only legitimate location within that territory was going to be Laurel, put in a placeholder application, paid the application fee. The Stronach applica application was disqualified and the site within the territory that had been, we thought, dedicated for racing, because it would not be a Pimlico, went to Cordish, and that and we all know now is a, one of the most successful casinos in the United States. But I would tell you that February 9th, 2009, was probably one of the most important days in the history of Maryland racing, because that which we had fought for and we thought would support the industry for the future um, evaporated. Uh, I'll never forget that day personally. And so the question was, what are we going to do? And uh, Frank ran in 2010 and partnered with Penn Gaming and um, uh, began efforts to try to um, acquire gaming for his facility, challenge the disqualification. But at the end of the day, he applied in late 2010 to the Racing Commission for 40 live racing days. That would be the racing calendar in Maryland, all to be run at Pimlico and around the Preakness meet. In essence, it was the end of Maryland racing and breeding. And the industry, I, I, in all the years I've been doing it, I never saw more people show up at the racetrack. I think Mr. Ullman, you, you might have been, you were on the commission. I, I, I shared that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and um, <laughs> very heavily covered by the media. And we essentially told the commission that if they granted a license, Number one, the horsemen under their federal rights would not grant simulcasting rights, so there would be no simulcasting of any of the Maryland live racing and the Preakness, but that it was the end of the industry. The gates were going to close and horses were going to be asked to exit, exit the track. And so the commission rejected the application. And Governor O'Malley asked the racing commission to convene meetings, and we started negotiating what became uh, in 2011 as the 10-year agreement that begins to form the foundation for why we are here now. And that 10-year agreement provided for um, a guarantee by the Strider Group of 100 live racing days, with the horsemen and breeders purchasing 46 additional live racing days, because the sense was at the time we were going from 220 down to 146, but we felt that we could maintain a year-round, strong year-round business with 146 live racing days but we were going to have to pay for a portion of that. And that was accomplished both through monies coming from our share of Paramutual Handle, not gaming revenue, and a shift in our share, ours to horsemen and breeder share of the Paramutual Handle by 3%. Um, approximately $8 million as the years have gone um, that the horsemen and breeders have been paying. And what became purchase of racing days actually became a subsidy. And um, that um, is how the 10-year agreement started. It allowed Bowie to close as a training center so they could consolidate at Laurel, but they were required to build a sufficient number of stalls at Laurel to accommodate the loss of the stables at Bowie. And so they built what we call the tent barns, and Tim and David can tell you about the tent barns. They're very similar to barns that were built, if not identical, the barns that were built at Gulfstream Park in Florida but the mid-Atlantic is not Florida, and the winter months were very difficult for the horsemen, notwithstanding other issues with respect, with respect to the 10 points. But I have to tell you that the, the time with this, with when Frank 
Stronach was running the tracks and, and there's been massive turnover, even going back to when, when he was chair, but uh, Tim Ritvo, things were very successful here. It was a partnership between the industry and the track. Uh, I think David would tell you, having been intimately involved with them, that things were good. We built the racing surfaces, working with the MTHA, uh, made improvements on the backside, made improvements to the front side facilities, and things were going good until uh, about 2018, when a family feud broke out and control of uh, the, I guess we'll call the Maryland Jockey Club, the Stranach organization, changed hands from uh, Frank to his daughter. And she came in and um, we started to see changes. First, she went to the General Assembly, asked for permission to move, or not permission, she wanted to move Pimlico, she wanted to close Pimlico, move the Preakness to Laurel and consolidate racing with a super track at Laurel to be underwritten by Medco. And it created tremendous animosity in the General Assembly. General Assembly rejected the legislation and then the city of Baltimore followed that with a lawsuit that they brought against uh, Maryland Jockey Club struck to, to eminent domain Pimlico and to condemn an eminent domain Pimlico and the Preakness. And from that started quiet confidential negotiations that I was asked to participate in to try to settle that lawsuit through a concept plan that um, we worked on. And it's the concept plan that is the forerunner for what we're working on now. But under that plan, um, racing would be consolidated completely at Laurel. There would be one facility um, completely rebuilt. Pimlico would be redeveloped as a commercial zone with a new clubhouse, <clears throat> rotated racetracks, and a um, new facility at Pimlico for racing that would only operate about six weeks a year for the Pimlico Preakness meet. The property would be donated to Baltimore City. And um, the Stronach Group, MJC, would lease the facility for the length of the Preakness meet, and then everything would stay year-round at Laurel. And it was estimated to cost $375 million. We went to the General Assembly to be overseen by the Maryland Stadium Authority with the issuance of bonds to be paid for by a $5 million a year deduction from the uh, purse dedication account, the monies that flow from the DLTs to the horsemen and breeders, um, money from the city of Baltimore and redevelopment money that was the track share of what they were getting from DLT revenues. And as we now know, over a period of three to four years, that plan ran into massive difficulties, some beyond our control, some within our control. Uh, and it became very apparent as the stadium authority studied this program that the cost to do Laurel was prohibitive, more than double the cost of what we first estimated and double what the legislature had authorized for that project. And so we were asked by the General Assembly two years ago to start meeting with the stadium authority and coming up with a plan that was what the horsemen envisioned for the future, not necessarily what the track operator wanted, but what we thought was in the best interest. We studied that with the stadium authority, even to the point of converting Laurel to a training center. And even that was massively expensive. And so um, having reported to the General Assembly last year, they um, mandated a number of things. When they brought Medco in, um, and the reason they did, there's a tax issue that we didn't see originally, but became the sort of Damocles over this project. Under the concept plan, Belinda was donating, Belinda Stronach, Stronach was donating Pimlico to the city of Baltimore, but she was not donating Laurel, was retaining an ownership interest in Laurel and agreed to run live racing in Maryland for the life of the bonds. Okay. Um, and if capped by uh, a, a quirk in the federal tax code, if improvements are done to a facility, an arena, sporting, privately owned, the, the cost of those improvements are taxed to capital gains rate. And that was a tax that I, I'm not sure I would have been willing to pay that on. It's not a criticism, but they clearly weren't going to pay it. And that's a cost on top of the cost of redoing Laurel. And the only way around it was for the property to be conveyed to the city of Alt uh, to the state of Maryland and Arundel County or through a not-for-profit. Not knowing what the value of Laurel was, the Pimlico Stadium Authority, uh, I'm sorry, Medco was authorized to 
studying the value of the properties, but also talk to the parties about what kind of model would work going forward. Um, we were authorized, the horsemen and breeders, to sit down with the, um, with the track operator and give our vision of what we thought would happen in the future. And the stadium authority was to issue two reports last fall, which they did. Um, on top of that, the 10-year agreement was coming to an end. And in um, as much as we tried to negotiate an extension unsuccessfully, in November of last year, the Stronach Group asked for a massive amount of increased subsidies from the industry, prohibitive. Uh, it was a non-starter. Um, and so we negotiated with them with the legislature going into session. And we had been paying approximately $8 million, $8.3 million a year for the 10 years. We agreed for a period of six months to pay an additional $2 million to keep things going. And then as we got to the end of the legislative session, we had to put up another $2 million. So that it was a constant, we need more money, we need more money to operate. And um, it, it, it was getting to the point where it was just not sustainable. I mean, you can see there that um, we paid 11, what we're paying this year in subsidies to the track operator, $11.4 million. And we've paid over $92 million in subsidies since uh, 2011. Um, <clears throat> So this year, the obviously the project completely stalled. And that's why you're here today. Because one of the suggestions that we made was the creation of an authority that would pick up from where the industry left off when this project stalled, for this authority to study the situation and jumpstart the program if possible. And then to look at operating models going forward on how this industry can sustain itself. And that's where we um, we are today. And so with that, um, <clears throat> I'll turn that back to David and Tim, and then I'll pick up at another point. So, you know, and talking to, and part of Alan's discussion just a minute ago was talking about the 10-year deal and, and having to renegotiate it and renegotiate it and the instability and the uncertainty of are we going to be racing next year you know here we are in november are we going to get an extension we tried to do we get a year extension a two-year extension what was a six-month extension with more money well then we get through three months of that six months and we still got to kind of lay out another six months so it's the constant not knowing what's going to happen to the future it's, it prevents people from wanting to come come to maryland it prevents people from wanting to stay here in maryland and people that are here does it make sense for us to invest into our into, into the horses, into young horses moving forward? I mean, look at last week's Timonium sale. I'm not want to take anything away from your presentation, Cricket, but it was down 30% for the Maryland brands on 8 or 25%. Maybe it was just a coincidence, or maybe it has something to do with Craig Frabel's presentation that the week before stating their vision of 80 live racing days in Maryland. So, you know, I was at the sale, and I'm walking around with some other trainers, and we jokingly said to one another, what are we doing here buying Maryland breads? We're not, you know, who knows if we're going to be, be running live racing in, in the next couple of years. So obviously it's it's it plays on everybody not knowing what's going to happen. It's the uncertainty. And as David and Alan said, Maryland racing has gone through so much turmoil, even in the years I've been here. And it's just every year it bounces back. It's the resiliency of the Maryland horsemen to keep coming back. We have great horsemen, very good horses, a great industry. Now, again, not only the racing industry, but the horse industry, and, and 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 so it's just that for me as a trainer, making my living in Maryland, training horses uh, with my owners, with my employees. That's the biggest thing I hear. I mean, I hear people, guys that work on the gate crew, guys that work in the ballots for the for the jockeys, and they come to me because they know that I'm head of the organization. There are a lot of rumors that go around, so they know I'm not going to bullshit them, and I'm going to tell them exactly what's happening out there and you know, Tim are we going to be running next year what's the reality do we need to look for another job are we going to be here next year so unfortunately I I can't give them an answer right now so that's a lot of the instability and the uncertainty that we have moving forward and also one of the the um, biggest questions that we get is you know will my horses be safe will they be safe uh, during racing and training. That's a big problem that we had. Tim can really touch on. Yeah, we had an issue with the track superintendents. You know, one of the issues that we had, a lot of the really great employees that we had with Glenn Kozak and Robbie Mitten, a lot of really good guys, they got out of town when Stronics came. And, you know, they're up in New York doing their things, and it's been very difficult finding good, reliable, qualified individuals to 
as David said, maintain something as simple as a racetrack. That's the most important thing to maintain as a racetrack. Um, and we went through a period of time that you know the, the tracks, in our opinion, weren't maintained where they should be. We had a uh, last year we went through. I'm sure everybody knows it. We had a spat of, of fatalities and breakdowns. David and I and and another board member we actively went out to search for a track superintendent. Um, and and again, anyway, make a long story short. We think we're finally comfortable right now with, with who we have. I mean, earlier this year, we had to bring in uh, uh, John Passero. MTHA had to pay John Passero to come in here and look at, after the racetracks. Um, we paid him. And anyway, the, the, the stipulation from the Maryland Jockey Club was, yeah, you can have him come in, but we're not going to pay him. And, uh, you know, anyway, John came in. He worked for us for uh, three, four, five months. Uh, David found Kenny Brown, who lives in Laurel. He's a great track superintendent. Uh, he's been at uh, Canterbury, Colonial Downs, Delaware. He was at Laurel for a number of years. We worked out an arrangement. We met with Mike um, Mike Rogers, and and they and they hired Kenny Brown. But it was because of the MTHA that found the Kenny Brown. I mean, those are the simple things that you know. Again, we're happy to help, but we don't. You know why it's a, a, a MTHA's deal to have to go out and try to find a track superintendent. I'm, I'm using it as an example to give you some background and some context on what it's like to deal with Maryland Jockey Club. So they're great, and they have great people that work for them. And George Ann Hale is awesome. She's incredible. She's been there forever. She's one of the best. But you know, she's hamstrung. And I know Mike Rogers is too. Mike Rogers is a great individual, but he's been there as a part time uh, CEO of the, of the, or the president of the Maryland Jockey Club. And he just doesn't have the, the authority to do, in my opinion, what he needs to do is really to order to run this racetrack and to get things done. Mike's great, Jordan's great, but they're all hamstrung by what they can and can't do by corporate. That's a big issue that we have. And also back to housing. I mean, that's a huge concern for our workforce. Um, I, I, Mr. Rollman is, you know, a former chairman of the racing commission. It's he understands that it's been a long time quest to just get basic decent housing for our workforce. That's a big, that's a big concern for, for our horsemen and the people that we represent. It's, it's, it's an inherent upon us to improve our housing conditions on the back stretch. Uh, that's so we can just maintain our skilled workforce. I mean, uh, getting labor in any industry is difficult, let alone living in the conditions that uh, on our back stretch of Pimlico and Laurel, that they're, they're forced to. It's, it's just, it's not sustainable as an industry, any industry. Um, and um, also, is there a long term financial plan to continue Maryland racing? Those are the concerns facing Maryland racing from our perspective. So, and it really leads us to believe that the status quo operating model just, it, it just it's not sustainable. It, it's really not sustainable. So, uh, I'll let Alan. Let me continue just, as to what our vision is moving forward. Let, let me just pick up on, on what I think we all think is the most important thing that has to happen through this authority. I mean, it's going to be the decision of the authority what the footprint of Maryland racing is going to look like. We know that challenges with Laurel and Laurel probably is not going to be an option. Number one, we need stabling for at least 1,400 horses. Now, I know there are numbers have been banding around that you only need 800. 900, there's only 1,100 horses here um, to sustain year-round racing in Maryland because there's an ebb and flow of horses coming in and out of the state at various times during the year. But to sufficiently support the program here and run the program here, we believe that we need a minimum of 1,400 stalls. Um, quite frankly, we need room for growth because if our vision is correct and if we think that we can accomplish what we see for the industry going forward. We'd like to have the ability to grow. So we put our if we put ourselves into a position where we are squeezed in, however it's done, and do not have the option for growth, then why are we doing this? Is it just to preserve what we have or is it to try to grow this industry for the future? And I would submit it's that we want to grow the industry for the future. Um, <clears throat> the 1,400 stalls also means that we need sufficient stabling for a receiving barn, detention barn, quarantine activities, claiming, drug testing, all the things you need to run a good racing operation. Um, the sustainability of Maryland racing and breeding. 
depends on year-round stabling and year-round activity in this state. It's that simple. If we get into a situation where we're running boutique meets, we have to close, we force our horsemen to go elsewhere. You cannot sustain a viable year-round racing industry in this state. Um, and in conjunction with whatever stabling plan is established, you need open space. You need round pens, grazing areas, space for horses to move, people to move. The second thing is safety. And you heard that last week, and there's no disagreement in this initially on safety. But I would tell you that Maryland's racing industry doesn't take a backseat to anyone in this country with regards to safety and welfare of our horses. Um, coming out of what was a debacle at uh, Aqueduct Racecourse 11 years ago with 21 fatalities during their winter meet that I had the privilege of uh, being asked to help investigate. We in the Mid-Atlantic established what's called the Mid-Atlantic Strategic Plan to reduce equine fatalities. And we're not just talking about equine fatalities because that's something that rocks everyone. It's like a loss in the family when we have a fatality. But it's about breakdowns. It's about injuries. It's about preventing in injuries. It's about assessing risk, identifying horses at risk, because that is the single biggest threat to our industry, bar none. And I know Tom would tell you that from a national perspective. Horses dying or injured on the racetrack is the single biggest, biggest problem we face. So we established what's called the Mid-Atlantic Strategic Plan. Every horseman's organization, veterinary organization, breeders organization, racetrack in the Mid-Atlantic region has participated in this plan for the last eight to nine years. And it is the forerunner for and is built into the HISA safety program, okay? It's the Maryland program, it's the NTRA's accreditation program, and with obviously the fatalities that were um, that plagued Santa Anita uh, back in 2019, there are reforms that were adopted in California that are built into the plan. But we've been doing this. We've seen a 58% reduction in fatalities through this plan, All right. which leads to the problems that we had this past spring, racing surfaces. We're fighting climate change, it is a challenge to uh, not only assess our track surfaces, but to maintain them. We had, the uh, horsemen have been complaining for recent years since the change in ownership about the condition of our racing surfaces, and the maintenance of those surfaces. And as Tim described to you, it got to the point where we had a crisis here in Maryland that was covered nationally this spring with horses that were breaking down on the racetrack at Laurel during racing and training. And we could not get the fixes that we wanted. And we ended up having to do it ourselves and pay somebody to come in here under severe restrictions. And that had to stop. And we're pleased that uh, Ken Brown is coming to work with us. But that's a day to day challenge that doesn't end and forces, I think, this group to look at what is now being discussed in the industry. And that is, do we start embracing synthetic surfaces, which will help us to not have to fight climate change on a daily basis, moisture in the racetrack? hiring people to assess our racing surfaces on a day-to-day -day basis, deciding whether it's safe to run, and most importantly, for our horsemen and our owners, and they're investing in the business, to protect our horses. So safety, uh, working conditions, safe barns, up-to-date barns, security, cleanliness, and maintenance are primary things for our backstretch workforce and house it. Our housing situation with our backstretch workers is not something that any one of you would find acceptable. And it is something that needs to be corrected through this plan and should not be allowed to continue. We are willing to collaborate on a uh, on a different racing schedule. You know, we understand that there may have to be reductions in racing days, but we have to do it in a way that's intelligently done. It's done with the best interest of Maryland racing at heart. Just raising purses, shifting money to the operator, and shrinking racing days is not going to sustain this industry, and that's not a sustainable model. We're moving the industry so that the higher end, the elites, get to control our racing. We have hundreds of people here with their families, and I could go down the list of names who supported this industry for decades and who don't deserve to get squeezed out by some new model where we're catering to the elite, we're reducing racing and forcing them to go elsewhere. Um, <clears throat> and we don't need to be working under a system where we are dependent upon having to pay subsidies, 
organizational problems with the operator, whoever the operator is, or the profit motive of an operator when there is no gaming in this state to support our industry uh, and how that model and how that model would work. And finally, on that uh, one point, and then I have one other, um, the Preakness. The Preakness has always been the crown jewel of Maryland racing. It's one of the great sporting events in the world. It's one of the great sporting events on the annual calendar. And it's something that Maryland and Baltimore has always taken great pride in. And that event has always sustained this industry. It has helped to sustain this industry on a year-round basis. And it is mind-boggling to us that prior to the organizational change in, I guess, 2018 and going back to Preakness, we generate a profit that's based on um, figures that we've been shown by the operator. And if you look back at annual reports of anywhere from seven and a half to $11 million a year, and now it's losing two and a half, three million million a year. How do you do that with one of the great events of the year? And what does that mean for our business? There's something wrong there that we believe not only needs to be fixed, but we think we can fix and bring it back as a Maryland-based event that will be the pride of Maryland. Um, we need innovative uh, revenue streams. Um, we have a sports betting parlor at Laurel, but we don't have a sports betting license. And there's been no application for a sports betting license. Um, that is a revenue stream. That is one of the futures of this industry is sports betting. We have one OTB that is applied for and Timonium has applied for and is actually conducting sports betting. We're not doing it. Um, we need to look at our advanced deposit wagering relationships, uh, collaboration um, with lottery products such as the racetracks game, which is the state um, lottery game that competes against us with our product. Yeah, we should be working with the state to bring that back to us. Okay, That's a problem for us. That's competition. And would help to, quite frankly, make this program work and make the redevelopment of our racetracks work if we could tap those funds. And we need to think outside the box. And I know people like the guy sitting next to me who are really innovative thinkers outside the box. And finally, um, operating model. <clears throat> this is not something that's coming off the top of anybody's heads. It was suggested a year ago. Why not look at a not-for-profit model for Maryland racing? And that was actually broached by the Strana Group. Admittedly, when they were talking about it, they were talking about Laurel because it's, they would have been happy to bifurcate the racetracks in Maryland with the industry taking Laurel and they keeping Pimlico, which for us was a non-starter. But the nonprofit mo model was not only studied, it's contained. That is from the report that was issued by the MTHA, Maryland Horse Breeders Association, and the Maryland Jockey Club in collaboration of a not-for-profit model to operate Maryland racing in the future. And what's interesting about that, before there was any legislation, and before those of us who thought about creating authority did it, look up in the right-hand corner, we suggested the idea of a racetrack operating authority, which is what we have now. And then that would flow down to a not-for-profit entity that could operate our tracks with innovative management, good management, no subsidies, and is dedicated to Maryland race entire. Um, and of course, if the arrow goes down to the Laurel training facilities, that's most likely not going to happen. Um, and that may be Pimlico and a training center. But that's the model. And that's the one that we think needs to be carefully studied as an alternative to private operation. Suggest to you, here's the Medco report. Medco said the same thing in their report, an independent report. They had talked to all the different stakeholders and what they, what came out of it to them was that a future operating model that's best for Maryland, not dependent on the finances of a private operator who's not getting gaming revenue and how that, how's that operator gonna make a profit without subsidies from the industry <clears throat> is to let the industry let the industry operate this business in partnership with the state, not to have the state run racing, which is not what we're talking about, but let the state support and work with the industry to help make that strong. So those are our recommendations. Um, and I think they set the stage for the work that the authority needs to do. And I'll send it back to David for closing. Um, yeah, we're open to quite, okay, take questions now. We'll or? do it after the breeders. Okay, All right, well, that concludes our report, Tim.
Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you guys thank you. for the opportunity. <laughs> okay, now we're off to the breeders. We stand up. <laughs> so, Crick Goodell, who's the executive director, is here with us, and um, Kent Murray, who is the president, is, is here with us, and they're going to give us uh, their breeder presentation. So, we'll get that pulled up and we'll get started. I have to say, I don't think there's anything in the MTHA's report that we disagree with. We're all in this together. Um, this industry is going to live or die by a, a good partnership with the horsemen and the breeders and the track operators. So that being said, we will tell you about what we do, what the Maryland horse breeders do, and what the um, what the agricultural component of this industry is. So. Um, I'm Cricket Goodall. I'm the executive director of the Maryland Horse Breeders. I have been around almost as long as Alan. Um, I was a little girl who fell in love with horses and started working for the Horse Breeders 38 years ago, right before the first Maryland Million. So here I am today. I've done almost every job that they, you can find in the industry, so I'm pretty familiar with all of it. I love the breeding part. I love the farm, farm part. So we're here to tell you about what we do and what we think you know, steps might help us survive and thrive in the future. Okay. So the horse breeding industry is all aspects of agriculture involved in maintaining horses of breeding age, raising their offspring, and encompasses the horses, their owners, their caretakers, as well as the associated farms and many ancillary service providers. Okay. So the equine industry significance, the horse pointed this out too, from the most recent numbers that we have, economic impact numbers, there are more than 28,000 people involved in the equine industry. Over a billion spent annually by the industry participants. More than 705,000 acres in Maryland are devoted to the equine industry with an economic impact of 2.1 billion. The economic impact of the racing and breeding sector is over 507 million, and the tax revenue is 80 million, as the horseman said. Okay. So the Maryland Horse Breeders Association, that's what that's who represents the farm horse farmers, if you want to say, and the breeders and owners. Many of the people that the horsemen represent are in the business, horse business, breeding horses as well. So they're our members. Um, we are very proud to say that the Maryland Horse Breeders is the first state thoroughbred breeders association in the country, founded in 1929. And we also have the first state thoroughbred breeders incentive program, the Maryland Bread Fund, which you're going to hear more about today. That was founded in 1962. Now every state that has parimutuel wagering has an incentive program to encourage the people that are doing business in their state to stay there and do their business. So, um, that's very important and a, a significant part of why we're talking to you today. And we have the first one day state sire, Jim McKay, Maryland Million Day, coming up the 14th of October. Um, we are really one of the, the first regional event that was focusing on Maryland stallions. Now it's been copied all over the country by every significant breeding state with a stallion focused race program. Stallions are a huge part of the breeding industry. Okay. So what we're facing today is a declining number of mares and stallions nationwide. Globally, the numbers are shocking with foal protection, thoroughbred foal protection. That's impacting every aspect of our business. And so Maryland actually, as the Strong Group pointed out last week, the, the full production, the breeding industry here has really held its own in the last few years. With It's contracted, but it's we're producing a pretty steady number of horses. I don't know if that's going to change. The, the national full numbers are still dropping. So, um, you know, we're worried. There's a shrinking, significantly shrinking on-track attendance. You can see it in the Maryland million numbers. It used to be 15 or 18,000 people a year, you know, before COVID, it was even starting to drop, but you know we may get hopefully four or five thousand this year. So that's a concern. You want people to be there to see it. Now, you know, other forms of gaming have impacted that dramatically, but we still would like people back at the track. And we're losing breeders and owners mainly because what Tim talked about the cost of producing a horse and how quickly you can get or can you get a return on your investment. It's it's hard. It's it's a challenging business with lots of ups and downs. 
Ken's going to talk to that a little while, a little while, and Tom can speak to it as well. But that's a huge concern for us because we, you know, we need people to keep producing horses. There will be no racing product without Maryland bred horses in Maryland. Okay. So this is the bull crop. It's in five-year increments. It's um, showing a steady, pretty steady hold, which is good. Um, but we're, we are significantly um, supported from the legislature from slots revenue. And a portion of that goes into a breeding incentive program. We are under challenge from the surrounding states. We have been for many years, but some of them are finding more different um, other revenue sources, which is beefing up their their breeding program. So we're going to speak to that in a little while. Okay. So the horse breeding industry is holding steady, as we as I just said, but witnessing really competitive challenges in the region. Virginia is is growing dramatically back from the ashes. It was really a dead industry, um, and now. Because they have historical horse racing machines, Churchill Downs bought the track down there, and they are really significantly investing in the production of horses in Virginia. Uh, legislative support has been key to maintaining the horse breeding industry pretty much anywhere, um, but certainly in Maryland. Maryland red horses make up a third or more of all horses racing in the state. It's particularly important to the racing product now and in the future. A strong breeding industry ensures a strong racing industry. A strong breeding program also plays a critical role in Maryland's agricultural and open space because you need horse farms, you need room, you need beautiful horse farms to produce these horses that are then going to go on to be race horses. So um, we think that, you know, it, it's just critical that the breeding industry um, be invested in, in the future because it preserves great swaths of green space in most every county in Maryland and very vulnerable land. Okay. So this, Kent's going to talk to you about this. Kent is the owner of a wonderful horse farm, river farm in Darlington in Hartford County, standing our top stallion in Maryland, Blofeld. So he, he's going to talk you through what it's like to live on a horse farm for a day. <laughs> Cricket, I'll come up also. <laughs> So as you see, um, every every horse that's in a stall has to have that stall cleaned every day. Every horse that's in a stall has to be fed twice a day. And that's Christmas, Easter, every holiday you can think of. So there's no, day, there's no days off. And that's true in the track. That's true in the farm. So farming a horse is a full-time job. And it is full-time. There's no days off. Every brood, brood mare has to be examined by a veterinarian before breeding, after breeding. Um, and at any time there's an anomaly, we have to call up a vet. A vet has to travel to the farm and look at the horse. So it supports a robust veterinarian business. Um, every brood mare is bred an average of once or twice, and that's done by a three-person team. So it's you don't just turn a couple horses out in the field and wait for them to mate and then bring them in in a couple of days. <laughs> it's a very controlled process. There's a person to hold the stallion, a person to hold the broodmare, a person to wash both thoroughly after, before and after each breeding. So it's not a simple process and it takes a skilled group, group of people. And they have to be resident there because if you have a successful stallion, as Cricket pointed out, you breed him two or three times a day. So, and, and that's what gets done with a very busy stallion um, in this state. Um, I won't challenge any of the gentlemen here to perform that feat. But <laughs> <laughs> that's what a stallion does uh, during the breeding. <laughs> so, and of course, every, every horse has to have a blacksmith, and this happens constantly. So, the vets are constantly <laughs> on the farm. The uh, blacksmiths are constantly on the farm. We constantly get new feed. We constantly get new hay. We have huge storage facilities to store both through the winter. So it's a it's a very active process, um, and it takes a lot of space. It takes a lot of manpower. But if you look at any horse farm, look around the horse farm, you see lots of fields where they're growing grain, they're growing hay. That's to support the horse farm. 
So it really contributes to the open space. The one horse farm is supporting all those farms around it while they supply and feed grain, um, hay and straw. So it's a very important industry for Maryland to maintain that open space that you guys enjoy and love to see every day. So yeah, so a horse is a grazing animal. It does best if it has like an acre and a half to graze. So that supports the open space. If you have a lot of horses, you need a lot of space. Okay. Yeah. Excuse me. Can whoever's on four four three ending in four four please mute? Can we mute? Can we there you go. Okay. Okay. Uh, excellent. Well done, Chris. Yeah. <laughs> so both uh, farriers and vets need to be local. So anytime we pay a farrier or a vet, they're local because we can't afford to have them be far away in another state. If you need a vet, you need them like right now. So they have to be relatively close. So we're supporting Maryland people when we bring a vet in, when we bring a farrier in, when we buy feed because it's got to be local too. It's expensive to transport transport big heavy feed and hay and straw so we really try to buy that all locally so it supports the whole maryland economy and of course farm workers need to be local since they can't be traveling long distances they got to show up uh, they don't get up at three but they get up at five six in the morning to be there by six or seven they work a full day and they don't want to go a long ways to travel home so plus if there's any emergency on the farm it's not uncommon for us to pick up um, the the uh, farm farm manager and say, hey, we need help. Um, the breeding industry is not easy. The foaling industry is not easy. It's not uncommon for a broodmare to have a, a difficult birthing. If you think about what happens to people, there are difficult birthings. And once that happens, you need help. So um, you need somebody local that you can call and say, hey, get up here like right away. So all this supports Maryland through all the trickle down effects. Next. So what measures can be taken to stimulate the breeding industry in Maryland? So the first one here, we've heard from the MTHA, we need stability. Stability trickles down to everywhere, not only the horse sales, um, but um, all the industry. I mean, everybody wants to know what's gonna happen over the next year with the thoroughbred industry. We need breeders to want to stay in Maryland and breed in Maryland so that we can maintain a robust breeding program. There's a large percentage in cricket. What's the percentage of Maryland breeds that run in Maryland tracks? It's more than 30%, 30 to 40%. Um, it's been growing because people want to stay in Maryland and race. You know, they don't want to go out of state. Yeah. <laughs> So if we took out 30% or more of the horses out of Maryland, we would not have a Maryland, uh, we would not have enough horses to race at Maryland tracks. So the breeding industry is very important. So um, next. So we've talked about additional revenue sources. Um, the historical horse racing is one of them. Other um, areas you can see on the bottom, the Arkansas, Kentucky, Louisiana, Virginia, all have this. There's been a debate of whether we need um, legislature approval to get that in Maryland. Some folks say we don't need to put it on a ballot. Some folks think we do need to put it on a ballot, um, but we need to resolve that and then get that at the tracks. It, it is a big revenue stream for all four states that you see up there. And it is not a difficult thing to do. All we need is approval and we can start implementing that. So next. So um, I'll let Cricket take over here. She's going to talk about iGaming and some other things. So these, we're just offering some possibilities to consider because I think we need to look at all kinds of things for an additional revenue source. So iGaming is any other, any kind of <coughs> online betting, and it's in addition to sports betting. I mean, it's any poker, or anything you can do in a casino, but you can do it online. Um, there was a bill that went to the legislature last year and did not pass, but I think you're going to hear about it again often. We don't know what it'll generate, but I believe, we believe, I think that we we can't ignore 
additional gaming resources because we did that with the lottery. And, and you know, you have to be aware that the horse industry needs to make sure that we are not being cannibalized or help. Uh, you heard about racetracks game that is using horses at for a Kino style game with the lottery. Um, it is important. It's generating a lot more money than the state of Maryland proposed when they passed it. Um, we did try to get a piece of the revenue early on and were not included in, I think we tried for two years, but now it's generating a lot more money. So we're trying to look for sources that um, are out there and we can make a case. You know, they're using horses to have a keynote thing. So if this, you know, if we can add another revenue source, which I think is critical, to be honest with you personally, these ideas can be converted into increased breeder and step increases to register Maryland Red Horses or Maryland Slayer Horses to make the program competitive with those surrounding states. So the states that you saw on the historical horse racing slide, historical horse racing saved Arkansas, but there was no horse racing. It was going out of business, and Oakland was the first, I think, racing state to get them. But that's what they live on, is just those machines. Virginia, Churchill Downs, that's why they bought Colonial. They're building a casino with historical horse racing machines. It's going to support all that they do. And Virginia is now probably our biggest competitor. We are losing stallions, apparently, to that, to for breeding in Virginia. Um, we've already lost uh, farms are filled up down there. So there's just, we have to be hyper vigilant about our comp competitors, I think, because if you don't pay attention quickly, you are um, at a disadvantage. Okay. So there's also the opportunity, we hope to develop a restricted race program. We have restricted stakes in Maryland now, which means they're restricted to Maryland bred horses or Maryland sire horses. But in Pennsylvania and Virginia, they're, they're, they're going to institute a more robust racing series program for restricted horses. It's been talked about and revisited. We did it early many years ago with the Maryland Bread Fund, but I think that it we need to add some of that to the racing opportunities in Maryland, but we need more money to do that. Um, so currently Pennsylvania, just in their restricted program, is 8.2 million. I have another, we'll, we'll review the, the brochure that I'm giving you because Pennsylvania actually has 16 million in their red fund. We have about eight. So, but okay, let's go. We'll be walk through this and then we'll. So the initiatives that would that need to be done is create breeder owner incentives that are competitive with the surrounding states, including, and this is critical, being able to pay bonuses, breeder and stallion bonuses. Or breeders, I guess the stallions you wouldn't, but breeder bonus is paid when there is no live racing in Maryland. So if there becomes a concentrated, um, a concentrated number of live days in Maryland, we need to be able to pay the people that breed Maryland bred horses throughout the year. It would take racing commission approval, but we have the ability if the racing commission would approve it. Because what that does is gives people a chance to you know, they, they can't look at it and say, oh my God, there's gaps in the in the time and I won't get paid. You'll get paid if your horses are running. It would be a defined uh, program. We would have to make the details of what East Coast and that sort of thing, but um, they're doing it in Virginia. Um, I think that's got to be the future because I think that the, the um, industry here needs to adapt to a very different future of looking at the numbers of horses nationally available, the number of horses locally available, and coordinate with other states so that trainers and owners have an opportunity to run. You're not there won't be long gaps where they can't run, but they might be running in Virginia or they might be running in Monmouth or Saratoga. So I think that for us, for the breeders, we have to be able to pay people or they they will get out of the business. They will. Um, so I think that's critical. So create increased opportunities with significant financial incentives for Maryland sired Maryland bred horses. All of that is to help people get an ROI, get some money, you know, get a return on their investment. It takes five years really, and we've got a bigger number on production costs than Tim had. But um, you know, people that breed horses have to wait a long time to even see if their product is viable no less whether they're going to get a return on their investment. 
create an economic environment conducive to maintaining farms for breeding and raising horses, thereby serving the state of Maryland and preserving open spaces and the integrity of the Chesapeake Bay. We live in a state where that's important. It's very important. And pasture is the second best filter for the bay after forest. So we are very aware there's lots of pasture and pasture development and pasture maintenance on horse farms. Great jobs in the industry. Of course, we want more, more jobs. Kent mentioned that and Farrier, but all the jobs, a lot of the jobs that David listed on his thing, it, it's all we're feed, you know, train. I mean, all the stuff we share a lot of the job descriptions and we want to increase those jobs for the state of Maryland. Okay. So we just wanted to show you some faces of the industry. These are people who are in it in one way or another. You see a farrier there, and you see the trainer, I mean, a, the horse farm owner, Lewis Maryland, and Jim Steele. So these are just, just, a, just a snapshot of some of the people that are, you know, making their life in this industry. This little girl may go on and be a jockey. Who knows? We need to start with kids, and that is one of our missions with the Horse Breeders Association. We do a lot of education and outreach because why a lot of people start as little children and they end up loving this industry and finding a career. Okay. So we gave you on here a lot of resources, links. I also have them in this handout so you don't have to break all this down. But it's just things to verify some of the information we gave you in here and in our talk um, if you have time to explore that. Okay. So just finally, summing it up, we at the Maryland Horse Breeders Association want people to foal in Maryland, to train their horses in Maryland, and to race in Maryland. That's our goal. We need to be able to reward people to do that with the Maryland Red Fund um, and purses and racing. I mean, you need all that to be able to have a viable, viable industry here. Without breeding, and reiterate again, without breeding, you're not going to have enough horses to put on a program, certainly for a significant you know, number of days, the number of days we've been racing. So I want to tell, that's the last part of that. I did give you, your, this is a take home for you. This is our brochure that we put together, which has detail, much more detail about what the horse breeders is, what the Maryland Grand <coughs> Fund is. Um, this came right out of the Maryland Racing Commission, which is again, a detailed description of the Maryland Red Fund. So it gives you probably more information than you might, uh, might need, but it tells you where the money comes from and where the money goes. This is an annual report from the Jockey Club of the numbers of production numbers. So step, mares bred, which is critically important to keep stallions here, and then full numbers. We gave you a snapshot on there, but if you've got detail in here, uh, again, a very similar graphic to what David had, just showing all the people that are involved that it takes to produce a horse and take care of them. And then this is our breakdown of costs. And we came up that raising, breeding and racing a foal to its two-year-old year costs nearly $100,000. Now that includes the input costs, that includes the mare and the stallion. And, but when you consider that and think how long it takes you to even have an opportunity to to get some money back. The commercial market is viable in Maryland, and that is an outlet for people that breed horses because they can sell them as yearlings, weanlings, yearlings, and two-year-olds. But not everybody does that, and I think that with those kind of costs, it's just getting more and more um, difficult to find people who want to make that investment and wait that long to get their money back. So. Speaking of the sale a little bit, Tim said the sale was down, the, the overall sale was down because the number of horses in the sale this week at Timonium was down because of the lower full numbers, all horses, not just Maryland Reds. Maryland Reds were actually four of the top five sales toppers in the sale this week. Um, so the people are even buying Maryland Reds and loving Maryland Reds. And yes, I think that the focus needs to be how to continue that. And, and make Maryland Brats more valuable. But right now, there's no, no shortage of people wanting to buy Maryland. Um, so regional fund comparisons, this is interesting. So you'll see the Maryland, as of the last 2022, this is published in Maryland Magazine, actually in Mid-Atlantic Our fund was about $9 million. 
Pennsylvania was 16, and Virginia, which is just coming back to life, was about two and a half, three. So Pennsylvania, you'll see ads of any of the industry who watch horse racing, they advertise 28 million because they give away a purse restrictive race program as well. So they've got twice as much as we do in the breeding program, and then significantly more if you add in the, the um, restricted race program. So that's been our problem in here and continues to be that we compete and are able to grow and compete because people go where the money is. I mean, the horsemen know it too. If they're big purses somewhere else, they're gonna go race somewhere else. And I think that the Maryland Horse Breeders, as the administra administrator of the Maryland Red Fund for the Racing Commission, is working to come to you guys, come to the legislature to find ways to, to get our Red Fund, our incentives, in a more competitive position with the surrounding states, or we're going to continue to lose horses. So that's it pretty much. Um, this is not your homework, but you have it to review. My card is in there if you want to call me with questions. Tom, do you want to chime in? You are certainly familiar with our industry. Yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to add anything. I think Kent and Cricket did a great job. I also want to say, you know, how impressed I was with the horseman's presentation. Um, it's great that we're pretty much hand in hand partners with them as breeders to the horsemen. Um, I, I will say that it's important to. To keep in mind from a national perspective, I've gotten the opportunity over the last couple of years to meet people all across this country. And our reputation in Maryland um, as horsemen and as breeders is one that other states that might have a bigger horse presence, specifically Kentucky, are always very impressed with the product that we yeah. put on the track. You know, when, when you talk about the quality of Maryland breads on Preakness Day or any other day, there's there the Maryland breads are very competitive with horses that might be considered better bred or from um, you know bigger stallions, so to speak. Um, and you and you know when I hear that, and I think about Preakness Day or 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 those type of days, I I I I, I agree. I'm just like we are. We we do keep up. Um, there's other states that have breeding programs where you might not see somebody from that or a horse from that state that is a very serious contender. So that that is a credit to uh, Maryland breeding and racing. Um, I'll also just you know say I'm very optimistic about what we're doing here and what we're trying to do as an authority with the team that we have in place and um, where we need to go. You've heard a lot of really good ideas as far as how to compete. And fortunately or unfortunately, we'll see, uh, competition relies heavily on money. Um, you know, just a quick anecdote. I had a couple horses at the sale. Uh, I basically gave them away. And I don't know if it's because there's uncertainty with what's going to happen next year. Um, one of which was the little brother to you know, horse I bred that got to race in the Preakness last year. I thought I was going to hit the lottery with that horse. And my wife had to remind me, like, we lost money. <laughs> so, you know, keep hearing that when you go home is probably a story that a lot of people that are in this room or on the call uh, can relate with. And love of the horse can only get you so far before uh, there's a business model which you can justify your expenses that what i'm doing makes sense beyond love of the horse um you know i i can speak for some probably breeding farms as well you know when you talk about getting breeding farms from one generation to the second generation to the third generation it gets very difficult um and to be able to justify to more than just a couple people to a lot of cousins and the like that this is a good model that we've got going here in Maryland. Um, so we've got to figure out ways that the economics of what we're doing makes sense. You know, as Tim can tell you, I send all of my foals now to Virginia to get that six month bonus, even though they're Maryland breads, when I, either I race them or I sell them, they have that Virginia bonus as well. Um, so, you know, I'm 
I'm contributing to what the innovations that Virginia has done that we have to do here. Uh, we have to be able to do the things that Cricket said with regard to bonuses elsewhere. Um, and, you know, we, or, or, or I'm afraid we're going to lose more stallions to Virginia. I mean, they're rewarding those people for breeding there um, in, in, a, in a way that, you know, they can afford to because of historical racing. So that's the only, that's the only anecdotes I'd say. I mean, you know, I, I just, I feel like, we are at a, a moment in time here with a unique opportunity um, to take advantage of and i'm i feel privileged to be part of that process so i'm very optimistic and um, i look forward to you know the next few weeks and getting our report out and if i could add if anybody wants to come out to see a horse farm you're welcome to come out and see it just contact me and you can come see a horse farm in a daily operation Okay. Thank you. Thank you all. I got a few questions. I'm sure there'll be others. Um, this one's for the horsemen, though. So what should our goal be? I mean, is it more purses? Is it more race dates? Is it more horses? What What's the goal other than survival and stability? Did I hear you on the survival? Yeah, I think stability is obviously, and I think we all realize with compete, the competition on the betting dollar from sports betting and and competition from the north, competition from the south. I think we understand that the days of running, well, Alan said 220 days in the past, it was, it's shrunk down now to 167, something like that. I think we realize we're going to have to contract some days. You know, I guess the question is, what can you contract to if you have to contract and still have a year-round product? Um, you know, without putting a number in concrete, you, know, you can throw out a number of maybe it's 140 days. Maybe it's 130, maybe it's 140, but you certainly can't go much less than that. And if we remove some of those live racing days and we shift down to uh, working out a circuit with Virginia because they seem the most viable to want to do it, I mean, certainly something like that in our vision um, would work. As Cricket alluded to, your Maryland bred. My biggest problem, I've got a barn. I breed, I train for a lot of Maryland guys, a lot of Maryland breeders, um, and we all, probably 85% of my barn are Maryland breds. I hate going out of town because when I go out of town to Delaware or Charles, well, I don't go to Charleston, Delaware or Virginia or wherever else, I lose the opportunity to make those monies. So if we're if we're going to do some sort of a circuit, we need to figure out a way where I can, if I take those, if we're closed in Maryland for a period of time and I take my Maryland breads out of state to Virginia, I'll still be afforded those opportunities to to realize those benefits. My owners will and my breeders will. Um, so I think that's important. So as far as our, our vision. I think we all can can be a little conciliatory and, and realize that we're going to have to make a change. It's, it can't be the same where we are right now. And if it's consolidating at Pimlico, if it's contracting some days, if it's working out a circuit with Virginia and also with Delaware, figuring out some way to to relate with Delaware, because that's where a lot of our horsemen are between the three of us, Delaware, Maryland, and Virginia. But it's the stability and it's a safe environment, safe racetracks. And knowing when we wake up in the morning and the next week and the next day, and when we invest in the stallion or we invest in a brood mare or we go out and buy a weanling, we know down the road we're going to be running to Maryland. If we get, let's just, we'll pick a number. I'll say it's 144 race dates. If we then increase purses, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Because I sort of hear both sides. If you have higher purses, a certain section of the population who drops out. I mean, you're always looking for to make, to make more money, but yeah, I mean, what at what point do then does that then attract the the better horses from New York or from Kentucky, and those um, those groups come in, win the purse monies, and and then take that money to their states? Yeah, I mean, I think right now we're running for four hundred a day, four hundred thousand a day, and you know, well, Stronic I mean, was what was it six hundred eight hundred? They're proposing six hundred. Yeah, I mean, that's just that, that's not going to do anything for the Maryland guys. That's gonna that will bring those those outfits from from New York and from Kentucky come in for those short period of times and the Maryland money will go out to those states. It will not stay here. I mean, Lou, you're an, yeah, you're, you're an owner. I mean, you know, how are you feeling about, you know, our purses are very good. They're very competitive. You know, if we got $600,000, I'll be out of business. I just bought five Maryland breads this week. They're not going to be able to run against the Kentucky and New York uh, horses. So no, yeah. we, we don't need higher purses. We need, it's complicated. Oh, yeah. You you have to have that sweet spot. And just throwing money at purses 
it causes a lot of problems as well as we've learned in this industry. So you have to find that sweet spot and we're, we're close to it. You know, could we take some more? Yes, we could. But um, uh, yeah, like Tim, like Lou said, you go too much, you're, you're going to cause yourself way more problems than I think you can. Well, that circles back to what Cricket was saying. She was saying, the horse, you know, the breeding will chase the money. So if I could yeah. add one thing to that, if, I think David hit the nail on the head. You, you got to know your sweet spot. We're not a top tier racing state any longer. I mean, there was a time when Maryland was. I think we're in tier two, the top of tier two. We'd love to get to tier one. Tier two tracks are absolutely critical to the foundation of racing, not only Maryland, but throughout the country. And you have to preserve those because they are the foundation. You cannot move this sport to just the elites. It will collapse if you do that. And I think Lou was right. If you raise your purses too high, you're going to invite the big outfits from out of state to come in and take those opportunities away from Maryland horsemen. And Maryland racing, as Tom said, it's great. It's very competitive. Our field sizes compare very favorably across the country on a daily basis, notwithstanding the challenges. And our purses are competitive across the country, even in the region. Um, so um, don't lose sight of that. But but one other one other aspect is that there are only two racing venues, racing states in the United States that are, are forward thinking, have the possibility of new facilities and appealing to a new generation. And that's New York with its massive redevelopment of Belmont, which is staggeringly beautiful. And we have the opportunity here in Maryland, and you're not going to get that opportunity again. And I don't think you're going to see that anywhere else in the United States. I agree. And so what's critical here is we need a state of the art iconic facility here that quite frankly, with the money that's going into the redevelopment plan, the horsemen and breeders are paying for most of it, but it's, it's the industry money that's going to make that program happen. And you're going to need a re because of the consolidation that's going to be required here and the potential loss of Laurel, you must have a state of the art year round training facility. It's a must because if you can, if, plan is to consolidate at Pimlico, it simply isn't big enough to accommodate what we've all said this morning is going to be necessary for that. Yeah, hey, we're going to get to the training. I just want to stay on the purses because I don't okay, want to, I just don't want to miss that. that. No, 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 we're going to get there. I got a lot. Can I do a follow-up to your question with yeah. the purses? Is there, is part of the sweet spot something that could benefit the people that actually bred here that might make the purses a lot more with the bonus? If, well, you know what I mean? Yeah, no, well, it could be. And that's why we've, we've really invested from the purse accounts perspective, really invested. And I don't have the numbers in front of me, but a really robust owner bonus program. So where Cricket says the numbers are X, you know, we supplement that X in the Maryland bread incentives through um, restricted stakes, through our really robust um, owner bonus program. And it really create, I, I believe we're the only state that has a developer bonus Since program. We started it too, but we did start it. And that, that was huge. So. So What's the, the developer bonus? So the developer bonus, if if you breed a horse or you buy a horse as a young horse and get it to the race, the oh, first okay. race here, you develop it. You get the developer it gets bonus. Claimed yeah. away. Well, even if oh, the horse claimed gets, away. Even, if, you, if it gets claimed, get it. you still get it forever. Yeah. You get an owner bonus if you own the horse, which is thirty percent. And if the horse gets claimed or sold to somebody else, the original developer still gets fifteen percent, and the owner, the new owner, gets gets 15 oh, so you're continually again it's like a breeder bonus you get money later even if you don't own the horse it was it was a huge um, so it started it, i mean that no, i'm sorry it started out as a as an owner's bonus of 30 percent right and then what would happen is is you know and horses would change hands yeah how do you incentivize somebody to bring the yearling along or the breeder? so if you're the owner of record when that horse makes its first start whether it's in maryland or california you're forever the developer of that horse and when it's back in maryland and it's first, second, or third, you always realize 15%. It's just getting money back more quickly, again, to the sense. person who put, you know, the original original money into the horse. So those were the know. creative things that, that we said, hey, we take that out of the purse account, yeah, and we great. supplement that as purse, we, we view that as purse earnings, but it incentivizes you to, to bring a horse to the races and makes it profitable. But mm -hmm. it's creative things like that, and like I said, we kind of invented that on the fly. It was Sal Sinatra's idea. Yeah. Um, so you need all three. You need an owner bonus, a developer bonus and a breeder and saying you need all of that to make sure that the person who is producing and continuing to race the horse in Maryland is going to do that. Okay. And I, 
I, and I don't, I'm not mean to, I'm not trying to drill down, but I'm just trying, I want to get some clarity. So, because it seems perverse to me that we want to stay small and not grow, either in terms of how lucrative the industry is or the number of course, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Because usually if you're trying to stay static, you're losing ground. So, I mean, is, is there no world where you're seeing that we can't like do a two tier structure or do something where we step up where our breeding and our horses then match the purses so we're not getting blown out of the water? I get the sort of protective aspect of it, but it seems, I mean, right now it seems like we're treading water bleeding. And if we just stay at that level, that's where we're going to be. So, I mean, what I hear you saying is we don't want a whole bunch more money, which makes no sense because everybody always wants more money. I, I, so I, I you could put in a preference program if you wanted to go that way. So, but I think where you're going with this is yeah. part of the problem is if you look at all the programs that you just saw. I wasn't going you, anywhere, Alan, because I'm okay. just trying to learn. You got <laughs> Okay, here's the point. If you look at all the programs that you talked about, if you look at the economics of the industry, and you look at purses. A lot of that's all we we can't touch. Purse we can't touch video lottery money that other states can tap into for whatever they do. That money is dedicated. But if we had it, you wouldn't want it. Can only be used well. But what we have to do is, out of the paramutual handle that goes to the horsemen and breeders, we pay for those programs. We pay eleven million dollars a year in subsidies to the racetrack. Okay, that money, which otherwise would go into the racing program, is going elsewhere, and that's that's the only pot of. Of I money understand that we have to do. I, I understand. I, I don't want it to come across like if, if, if we have if we have money, if we have the ability to raise purses. Yeah, let's raise purses. Let's increase the breeder programs. But we're sitting out around a room trying to figure out how we're going to jam everything collectively into one spot. So I guess my train of thought is, well, there isn't going to be any more money. Let's stop not... it. This is blank sheet of paper time. We are here to get it right. So okay. if the message is we need more money to get the purses right, then that's what we need to say. I mean, we don't. I mean, I, I, must, your question, I think right? we need the day. You need yeah. more. No, and, and the problems are bigger than if we were running for a million dollars today at Laurel, our problems still exist. Our problem is we're running in dilapidated facilities. Right. Our horsemen are living in 10 by 10, you know, 10 by 10. Those are huge problems. They're we're getting there. I started. We have, to support, we have to support our workforce. And we need to have an operator that's fully engaged in Maryland and dedicated to Maryland so we can grow. So just throwing money at purses. That doesn't solve the challenges. Right. You know, we it's it's a broader picture. Does that make sense? Is that if, if you have a year-round schedule here, you can raise your purses, your purses at a great level and new facilities, you'll go to the top tier of racing in the United States. You will reposition your own. And that's what the goal here is. Well, so let's talk about the operator because it was pretty convenient for Stronic to say we don't want to pay attention to the past since they are the past. So, <laughs> um you know, 2018 it shifted because there was a family dynamic and changes. Don't want to call out an individual. So, what's are they a good operator or a bad operator? I mean, let's just be plain about it. Currently, <laughs> they're negotiating <laughs> with them right now, so they're they're right. tougher there. No, right. I, I, I don't close. think they're they're not a good operator for Maryland. Anywhere. No, I mean it just. Yeah, I mean I, I I don't train in California and I don't train in in Florida, but I you know you can certainly see the problems that they have out there and they have in Florida and they have had problems here too. So, so what so. changed between 2018 and now? Lack the lack of, of the lack of focus. On, lack on of Maryland. management on the ground. Maryland management. Who, who's I mean, South last one year. South. Who's the last manager here? But if, if you look back over the history of the last 15 years, the line, the list of general managers, executives, you name it, is so long. There's never continuity. But I think, from what they tell me, um, and there's a lot of fear. I would tell you, a lot of people don't want to speak out out of fear. Right. This yeah. business is full of fear because I know the horsemen have their stalls and the racing opportunities, whatever. But We'd like to give you immunity for testifying, but well, <laughs> they, they can't take anything. The fact of the matter is, trying to get a decision. Who do you talk to? Who has the authority? Who is in charge? I mean, when I'm getting phone calls at seven o'clock in the morning from Tim Keith, standing over a struggling horse on the ground at Laurel and says, what do I do? I, I can't get anybody on the phone. There's nobody here. That's the frustration on a daily basis. When he, on opening day of Pimlico this year, opening day of the fall meet, 
There were no chairs set up outside of Pimlico. I don't even know if there was a food option for, do you want people to come or do you want them to just bet online? That's the kind of, you know, there are lots of things, but they add up. And that's because you need committed management and a committed operator who was committed to Maryland racing. Uh, not that, well, I think you asked the question last week, what is your plan for the future? Well, we'll look within our organization and see what we can do. That's not the answer. And that's why a not-for-profit model, which is one option. No, I know. Um, I was there. I think, I, think, oh, wasn't that I personally sure. think that if you look at Del Mar, if you look at Naira, it's eminently possible. And you can bring a committed team in here um, that is committed to the best interest of Maryland racing on a daily basis, is committed to the Preakness, is committed to what is important here, the breeding industry. And um, I think that's what it's and one comment. Yeah, so okay. I think they took their eye off the ball of racing and had changed to this entertainment strategy, which they pointed out last week when they were here, that doesn't really involve horse racing. And so consequently, nobody's going to the track. I mean, the attendance is, is dropping and they don't seem to care. And I've told them that. Um, but I think they at that time, the whole focus got away from racing to another strategy which doesn't seem to be working did well. the number of people i know the operators the local operators changed but were, have they really reduced the number of staff or is it just a lack of focus i don't know about that but i did, tim pointed out earlier that a lot of good people have worked for them and left many many people we could all point out that we have lost really good talent who didn't work stay with them and they are running the jockey club they are running naira naira so it, it's 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 a problem that's probably systemic to that company, I would guess. It seems to be because of the length of time it's been going on. But I don't know about staff. It seems to me we're running the, with the Maryland Million, which we're having next week, and I work with them on that. Oftentimes, the people that I work with throughout the year are not there on Maryland. You know, they're, they're, they don't last. It's, it, it makes it very challenging to, you know, there's a core group that are there, but they don't seem to be able to hang on to staff, in my okay. experience. Breeders, how much how much is Pennsylvania hurting us with the double to triple percentage? It's a challenge. It, Pennsylvania's been um, quite lucrative for a long time, so I think that people um, their their breeding industry. I'll say their stallions are not as good. Mm -hmm. um, they they took a big bump early on, and then um, the state has actually taken away some of the the money that they get to their incentives and purses. So the stallion, the breeding industry, I don't think is competitive as far as um, stallions, but they do produce more foals than we do because they race all year round at the different tracks, and they um, and so I think that Virginia is really what is keeping me up at night because do we they're see growing people so relocating quickly. to Virginia or just? They're doing what Tom said, sending their horses. There's a certified program. So you can have your horse born here and you send it there for six weeks. You can also do it in Delaware. Six months. Six, six months. months. Um, and then you get up, you're eligible for their bonus program. Same thing with okay. Delaware. Double dip. So if we win in Maryland, I get the Maryland and the Virginia. Well, I don't see how that hurts. I mean, tell me how does that hurt Maryland, though? Because I, as a Maryland breeder, I'm doing the same no. thing. I'm sending my Maryland breads to Virginia to get Yeah, there's certain. nothing wrong with that. I think people should take advantage of every opportunity. But what it does, it's filled their farms up with these horses that are going for six yeah, months. Okay. So that true. we don't have right. that opportunity. Okay. We don't have a certified program. So people should take advantage of every opportunity because it costs so much to, to breed a horse. But... Yes, horses are leaving Maryland yearlings, whatever they are, to be certified, and probably in Delaware too. So the farms, the okay. core group of horses you need to survive with a horse farm, are spending time in Virginia and not Maryland. So what I'd be spending a thousand dollars a month on my yearling on a farm in Maryland is now being spent a thousand dollars a month for right. a yearling in Virginia. Oh, that I see. I was about to ask that question. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> I was trying to figure it out. I was like, no, wait a minute. You don't have the cost, but you do get the income out of it. Yeah. So Jen, if you're creating Absolutely. an industry and they're creating volume for tracks because they were, wouldn't have had it otherwise. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And farms are, they don't make a lot of money. The margin on boarding and, and getting horses, even training is very, very small. So so 1400 stalls mr foreman 1400, 1400. total 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 plus you got i know receiving barn i got the that 1400 i think is the sweet spot number David, All right, so let's, 
net need for a center. How many states? I'm told. I don't know. I've asked Mr. Foreman this. But how many states have training centers that are essentially Florida? Florida, Florida is the one. Uh, Palm Meadows, and I don't know if you consider the training center in California. I think. Yeah, San Luis, right? San Luis, right? Have a training center. Nope. They, they they do do well, it's a private training center. It's okay. kind of like Fair Hill. Like Fair Hill. But yeah, there's but an opportunity an for private training. I mean, I believe that yeah. there is an opportunity to do that if you could, if there is stability. Would there be someone? Because there are people, the Bonifaces have a, a track on their farm, and there are people who want to train on their farm. And if they thought they could make an investment in that farm and, and have the ability to you know, rent stalls or something, I think they, they would consider that. And you've got Fair Hill, which is in Maryland. It's it supplies all up and down the coast, but there's still significant Maryland trainers, et cetera, owners that, that train at Fair Hill, which is. Are there? I looked when I first got this job. There was an article about New York tax incentives for the horse industry. Has that, do, do we have any tax incentives that help the farms other than the agricultural easements? Negative. We have negative incentives. <laughs> No, I mean, there are all kinds of in New York. They must have 32 different tax breaks. You don't, they don't breeding, the breeding tax. industry is not no. taxed. So anything that's a, 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 breed, a horse that's in a breeding age is not taxed. If you sell it, a stud fee is not taxed. Yeah. That Kentucky taxes their stud fees. And, and claiming horses are taxed. I think it's for Maryland, the only claiming and show horses, other pleasure type horses are taxed. So that it's an, it's a, Good thing that breeding stuff is not taxed amount, but actual incentives other than the ag incentives to keep your farm, you know, in a production mode. You know, that's yeah, all yeah most farms that. like we at our farm, we have, you know, we grow all kind of crops besides what we need for the for the farm for other reasons. For yeah, every reasons. beautiful farm you yeah. see, I'm sure, is getting an ag exemption on crop sure. taxes. When the, when the training center. Unless we add a, and that is needed instead of cancer, but unless we add a, let's assume that, that Pimlico is the host facility and you have a turf course, you have a turf course. But if one of those goes down, you're done until that's fixed. And so you may need, and even for training purposes, you can't, you got to be careful of the number of horses that you have at a facility, but um, for safety reasons. But the reason why you want a training center is because if you can't accommodate all the horses and the overflow has to go to a training center, if they're training on a surface that's virtually identical to the number one to the track where you're operating, number two, if something happens to the operating racetrack, that you have a place to go to run races if you have to as a fallback. Right now, for example, when Laurel went down, we shifted to Pimlico. If Pimlico, Pimlico were to go down, you go to Laurel. If you're only at one place and that's it, and you and you're, you're you have uh, surface issues or whatever you don't have any other options so then on the training center so i get i understand the training center is a center of gravity particularly if we're down to one track and we enter into some sort of circuit thing you know, it, it, it gives you one location where everybody is focused but how now the horses that are if i understand the horses that are at laurel run at laurel so it's sort of the product stays free and then they race at laurel but if we have a freestanding training facility how do we make that Maryland as opposed to I'm a Delaware horseman and I decided you've got a free fancy dancy training facility and I'm going to do it. I just think there are protocols in place as an agreement to train there. There are protocols in place that you, you stay with your horses in Maryland as you run in Maryland. I mean, it's kind of what we do right now. I mean, it's, it's at, at Laurel you have, you know, there's, I mean, George Ann can, you know, she might be good at answering this, but there are horsemen at Laurel that'll run their horses at Charlestown or run them someplace else. And it's a racing office job to recognize those individuals and bring them in and say, hey, you know, you guys are training in Maryland, you're training at Laurel, we expect you to run in Laurel. I mean, if there are opportunities that your horses don't have to run in those instances or those races at that home track, then okay, maybe you get a pass. But somebody that consistently trains in Maryland or at that training center there, but is going out of town, then I, I just don't think they have a place in that training center. I mean, there's a way you can put protocols in place to keep that from happening. Does that make, does that make sense? It does. We I had the discussion yesterday, and I was thinking, well, if we're going to go steal money from Delaware and bring it home, I don't know that I care. But I I was more worried about a Delaware-based trainer who was just parking the horses in Maryland for yeah. free and then going back and racing. I mean, it's an issue with you want races. To do it, I think I'm good with that. Go steal yeah, their no, money, I mean, bring it home. It's, it's an issue with filling races. If your horsemen are training in Maryland, taking up stalls, but then running and filling races at Delaware and Charlestown and every place else, 
then the product suffers here in Maryland because that same race that you're running out there has one horse less or two horses less. So. And our business ultimately is handle. And the less horses you have in a race, the less that are, are that you, the better bet on that race or revenue goes down. Why was that moral handle number so low? Because New York, or, no, oh, they this, showed last week. I can't even remember what it was. It was really. Do you remember? I think on the weather. Was there day. Well, there are any number of factors that would explain why handles down at a particular track on a particular day or the time of the. Well, day. they were showing an average, but Look. mostly it's 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 field size. If you, you track the field size, you know the betters bet on larger field sizes, more diverse turf races attract more horses. They have on average eight to nine. Uh, horses in the race, betters are attracted to to more options, and there's and and there's more revenue that comes to the it. National bull crop and the local bull crop. As that contracts, you know, there's just more horses to draw from. Our field sizes this summer, in many respects, were better than Saratoga on a daily basis, and they're paying extraordinarily higher prices at Saratoga. There are a lot of reasons for that. Part of it's name recognition, name recognition too. I mean, betters are going to bet on Saratoga versus Laurel Park. They're going to bet on on Pimlico over Laurel Park. Same horses, same do horsemen. Think, do you think a rebuild Pimlico would juice that number? Probably. I think so. And it was a joke uh, years ago that, you know, why don't we just change Laurel to Pimlico South? <laughs> yes, you know, we push that issue. Not, <laughs> we push that issue. It looks like that's not going to be necessary. Well, yeah. <laughs> just the name. It's unbelievable. But yes, it does make a difference. I mean, ultimately, that is our business. Handle is our business. At the end of the day, that's the, we're in the gaming business. We're, we're, we're selling bets. That's our business. Yeah, I mean, I've heard the criticism that that there, that we don't there just isn't as much interest in betting on Maryland racing outside of Maryland. I don't know that it's true or it's not true, and that number seemed to give some validity to it. Well, and that's what we feel that there's been a lack of focus on promoting that product. You know, get our product up on on sports wagering apps. You know, get our product mm -hmm. in more creative you know, methods than just, uh, I think we've done this, we've always done it this way, let's just keep doing it this way. We have to be creative. We've got to look at our product and figure how do we make it more attractive? When you're in an OTB in Arkansas, how do we get Merrill Racing to stand out? You know, what, what kind of innovations can we have on our signal that, that attracts you to bet on, on Merrill Racing? And that's where we need the focus of an engaged operator on the Maryland product to, to help us and that leads to other events too, like Maryland Million. I mean, we need, we really need, if we can, to offer other events because people love that. Maryland Million will get attention from betters. That the card is good. It looks like it's going to be good, and um, it it looks good for Maryland. It looks like we're doing something. Last question before I turn it around. I probably have another couple after the other people ask. Is there anything that we could do? to incentivize development of training on individual tracks, not to the exclusion of training centers in addition. So for somebody like the home, the farm owner that you talked about to build out, repl replenish barns, take courses on, train on their farm as opposed to putting them in a training center. They're gonna look at a for-profit model. So you have to give them <laughs> some opportunity. The farms need it. I mean, Kent at one point, his we re we recently did that a couple of years ago. We opened a, a training ago. track, and um, it, first of all, it's very expensive to build, to, so there's a very high entry fee, um, and then it's not cheap to maintain because, like the racetrack, it has to be harrowed every day, and you need to add um, sand and clay and everything to keep the surface correct, um, and then you need to attract enough horses to. Um, pay back all those initial sunk costs. So it's a very high entry fee and then a very long payback time to make the money back if to do that. And if people can get free stalls at the track, they want to do that and not pay for stalls on it or pay a farm to you know train their horses. So we'd be fighting against ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, I think if you could, I, I think some of the farms would benefit if you could draw more horses to them, but to compete with free is hard. So if we did something like the Virginia program, that would populate that kind of. It, it would definitely keep foals from leaving. Like I'm it, my own foals from my farm in Maryland. So well, Virginia. Hopefully Wilder, you would we, coordinate it again. We're talking about a circuit, so I would still allow them to use Virginia and Delaware and Maryland. So you give them a time frame where the horse could maybe. But do if all we three. qualify Virginia foals in Maryland, like Virginia is qualifying right. Maryland foals, then they would be shipping their horses up here. Right, and yeah, so we'd be doing just the opposite. <laughs> we're doing. Yeah. Right. You're not going to 
but that would dilute our pool of money available to incentivize the breed. Yeah, you would right? need to boost the, the yeah. incentive fund and you would also need to, um, the margin is very tight on boarding. And so sometimes yes. more horses on a farm doesn't mean more money to that farm. You know, you have to you have to work the numbers so you're, you're actually. Well, that's where I was when I heard about the Virginian program first before Tim educated me that, that we were getting $1,000 of spend on the local economy. Because <laughs> I couldn't I mean, figure the, it out the either. Farm owners can tell me more, but I know sometimes it sounds good to them. Let's fill the, the fields and put it. Quality, I mean, it, I don't know how to describe it, but more horses doesn't always benefit. More, more, it more horses it does benefit, though. If you have more horses on the farm, it's not a big profit, but like you say. But it keeps but, you in, alive, I guess. Yes, it keeps, it keeps your, you your alive. Health. Yeah, yes. there's, there's certainly a reason to do it. You have to have more money in the incentive fund to be able to add whatever that incentive, whatever money you devote to that certified part. Um, the bottom line, too, is, you know, like I, as these guys know, I made an effort to go get some stallions from Kentucky and bring them to Maryland. And, you know, the first question I get from the owners of those stallions in Kentucky is like, all right, we'll give you this horse, this horse, you know, champions that have won triple crown races. Um, can you get 20 mares to this horse? And I'm like, mm, I don't know that we've had 20 mares come to any of our horses recently. So like, I couldn't promise them that. And so they'd go somewhere else. But if we had a program in place where it's like, oh, we'll definitely get 20 mares because the bonuses for Maryland breads and Maryland stallions is so good that it's easy to get 20 mares. But, you know, I, I, I think Blofeld did well, but besides Blofeld and maybe Great Notion, I don't know any stallion in this state that's but getting Blofeld had proven himself, so you need to prove stallions. Sure. We've got a new stallion coming to Maryland. There is some good news. He's going to be introduced right after Maryland Million. He has proven himself. He has four-year-olds. He just had a two-year-old grade one winner. We have a guy who's interested in Maryland. He's from Kentucky, but yes, they want they want more than twenty mares to that horse. They right. want a hundred mares to that horse. And That's a lot. It's a lot. But so but I'm saying a, a, a bonus program that would reward even horses that might not be of the caliber of Blofeld who no, proves absolutely. himself. But you need to you know you need a proven stay in these days. Trying to bring a new horse just off the track, you wait five years. So I think that the stallions you were suggesting were. You know they've been in Kentucky, mm -hmm. but I think that I think we could support new stallions. But the mayor population, and that gets back to the owner who wants to put the money into breed a horse. But again, more money, more money is the answer to that. But what about the? I'm sorry. Let me let me ask one more follow-up question. So, how much are we losing farm capability to have breeding operations? It, I mean, this would you know like for a me who was not in this, and I'm like I want to get into a breeding. Tom's got, you know, he's got his thing going. You've got your operation going, but for somebody to set up a new breeding operation. That's what's okay. happening with this new stallion. It's you coming got that to a farm. That, or, I mean, is it, is it easy? Or do we have a volume of existing farm stock that if somebody wanted to come into the state and say, I'm going to set up a breeding operation, they could do it without well, like, the farm, reinventing the I mean, the yes, and, and, and the, the infrastructure, the people, the, the buildings, et cetera. But no, the core group of mayors, every, anybody that talks to me, I said, if you want to bring a stallion, you, you need to bring 40 mayors with it, or at least 20. Oh, I understand the mayor point. Okay, I'm just so, talking about. Oh, land. you absolutely yeah. have the infrastructure. I mean, Maryland's been doing it longer than anybody. And so this is a established farm that's getting this horse, but they have never stood a stallion before. So there's there's not a learning curve because the, they've worked in Kentucky, et cetera. But I think that um, establishing and having that horse be successful is the critical part. We don't want somebody to bring a horse from Kentucky and get, you know, okay, and mares next the year. Answer. So I think that there's a real opportunity, but it needs the benefit of more money to the breeders to get them to breed to our stallions. Right. And what do we think that number is? <laughs> Double what we have currently, the eight million. We need sixteen million. Oh, well, the, that's breeder and stallion. The stallion awards are ten. I mean, I forget the stallion awards. So if are, I if I got one of these stallions, I don't own the stallion. It'd be great to own. You can buy. You know, the, another way to do it is just to buy, maybe like a cast off. But as crickets alluded to, it's like, do we want a, a cast off, or do we want somebody who could be on the rise and. So the way you do that is they, they own they own the stallion, and what you do is you'd split the uh, the stallion bonus. So one of the deal the deals that I think most people make is, okay, we'll split we'll split the stud fee and we'll split the stallion bonus.
but I still have to pay to board that horse at my farm. I don't know if you have any of those. So, so the stallion bonus goes to the stallion farm owner. The, the, the benefit for a sired horse is Maryland Million Day. So most stallion people, and Kent may or may not agree with me, but when we've tried to and try to offer more incentives, those stallion guys want us to incentivize the people that breed to their horse. They're not asking for more money to them. They want to more offer bears. to their breeders, if you breed for my stallion, you get an added benefit. And that that helps their business. It's not so, that they're looking for an initial check back. Same sort of question I was asking them, although they do want more money. <laughs> so, do want more money. <laughs> and I know you guys do we too. I'm just teasing. <laughs> It's eight, we've got $8 million. Pennsylvania has 16 or 28, depending upon you count, how you count. I mean, what, what are we, how much money do we need to be more competitive with, with Kentucky, with Pennsylvania? I know we Kentucky's absolutely need, no to, need to be close or within range of the regional programs. Kentucky is not, I wouldn't worry about that. They were really not relevant for many years. They just have a perception of some added value if you fall in Kentucky. And it is an added value if you sell your horse in Kentucky. But we need to be close to what Pennsylvania and what where Virginia is. Is that number 16 or 28? Uh, it's 20 million, 16 to 20, I think. And, and if we include the owner bonus, the 8 million goes up. So we're you know, at least 10 to 20 that you can offer so that, and the the important part, which is getting into the weeds a little bit, is the percentage of the incentive money. So the breeder bonus is 30% or 40% or whatever. That That's a detail that's important because you want to be at, at the level of the surrounding states or close. We, we had 30% breeder bonuses for a long time, but the Maryland Bread Fund has to adjust to make sure that we can incentivize everybody. So our, our breeders incentive fund right now is 22.5, which is better than some, but not as good right now as, as Pennsylvania. So it's, so, how, so Pennsylvania is 16 to 20, are we at eight? Is that 8.2, did I get it right? That's the, yeah, that's the, that's the breeder's incentive fund. There is also the owner and developer bonus, which is another 4 million, David, probably. Oh, at least, yeah. Yeah, yeah and, so, I, and I'm not trying to put you guys okay, in church. So, so that's 12, right? So we, it's 12 versus 16 to 20. Yeah, what you're trying to do is say, we're, we're better or equal to right. our surrounding states, and we're not. And so um, I'm just trying to find out in math. So it's it's a four to four to eight million dollar delta, at least. And, and yes, going to add more. But I, I disagree with your statement that the stallion doesn't need bonus doesn't need bonuses because when you bring a stallion to the state, you try to sell portions of that stallion to spread your risk. And they're called stallion shares. And normally there's 40 shares per stallion and you sell some of those. And that alleviates some of the risk of bringing a new stallion. Now the people you sell those shares to want to see a return on their investment. And the return on their investment is frequently stallion bonuses. So that, is, that would be very helpful to induce yeah, not, new I, people to invest in stallions. I did not mean in the that, state. that that was not, I, I said it wrong, but I think that you need both. You need stallion bonuses to the stallion owner because that does incentivize them, but you and also need all the stallion owners. You want to reward. You all right, so I'm lost. I just need a simple, I, I understand it. Is it. Is it $12 million, including the stallion bonuses, and we're compared to 16 to 20? Yeah, but the number, the eight number includes breeder and stallion bonuses. So we need okay. to get to 20, okay. 16 and to 20. I also want you guys to know, I mean, also the purse account puts Oh, I know in, you're putting money And in. we put in about $8 million a year, too, in the Maryland Bread Incentive. So that's significant. So from the from the owner bonus to the developer bonus to Maryland Bread Stakes to restricted allowance. But when we're looking at Pennsylvania... I, under, I mean, that's easy because she's, I got the numbers, so it was sure. easy for me to understand. It, it, if, did they have that same $8 million coming from the purses? I'm just trying to get apples to apples. They have, I mean, they they have just, their their race tracks are race tracks. Yeah, they it's have a different, it's like apples and oranges. Yeah. But they do have, they do have restricted racing up in Pennsylvania. So like, they, that's money here is restricted to Maryland. Oh, Maryland I know, Center. Okay. So if that's your question. They do have the same, what that number is in Pennsylvania. We're going to, we're going to recap everything and get it in the form that can we do that so that you can sure. compare it a little yeah, yeah, yeah. more I'm easily. I'm just trying to learn. Bits and pieces. Yeah. And I've now monopolized it's all in, the questions. It's in this book, though. I mean, you can see the eight and 16. That's try, we're trying to do apples to apples here. 
but the, the I thought that's where when you see advertised yeah. to 28 that includes their restricted races and there's all the stuff that David's talking about got so it. the 8 million that they're putting in is on top of the 8 million I, got it. I just want to you know, <laughs> say the last time I talked to Anthony Manginero from Saratoga this summer the last thing I remember him saying to me was we need better science in Maryland so mm -hmm. I mean we spent a lot of money on a lot of things and uh, I think that that would help you know with some of our problems. It absolutely worked. Not, you know, not that Blofeld's not a great stallion, but yeah, you need more. You need more. You need, <laughs> so, so the theory is better stallions improve brings more mares. Yeah, um, that used to yeah. always be true. It's a it's more challenging because people have gotten out of breeding, so you're still you know need an active core of mares. A stallion will not be successful without a really significant core. 40, 40 balls a year, at least, or forty mares. So it's. We do need better stallions, but we also need more mares. All right, other questions? Yes. A couple of questions covered. Cricket, you indicated that perhaps we would pay um, Maryland bred bonuses when horses running out of state. I assume when our tracks were not Absolutely. operating. I assume that wouldn't exclude also paying owner bonuses. I know you represent breeders, but like well, you, Virginia pays both. You know, if I have a Virginia bred when he who runs when they're not running a colonial, I get a bonus. So We'd have to consult because the as, as David alluded to, the owner bonus has come out of the purse account right now. So um, we'd have to decide okay. how to do that. The Maryland Bread Fund, without more money, is not going to be able to do owner and breeder bonuses out of state. Okay. Yeah, I, it would be certainly something I would push for. I mean, I don't yeah. know that the purse account right now can legally pay for horses bonuses that run out of out of state. So as long as there's no be, risk, that was a fix. It would be more of an incentive sure. as an owner to buy a Maryland bread if I know I'm also Just like I said Maryland. before, yeah, I don't want to run my Maryland breads anywhere but Maryland. Right. So I don't. So the key is we're not running here. Yeah, the key correct. is no I'm live sure. racing. Yes, exactly. Okay. Absolutely. So if we had a circuit with Colonial, that's part of a circuit program. Okay. And then, Lou, the thought would be on a circuit would be kind of like how we did it before, and bonuses could transfer over if we could work out some right. of the logistics, okay. but also share resources as well. Like we used to have one racing office between the two, sure. one condition book. You know, the, those little things are important. Yeah, to the van, our horses, the colonial. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Um, thank you both for your presentation. Um, I just wanted to make sure that the authority was clear. Tim, when you talked about the racing surfaces and the fact that you had to fight very hard to bring in John Pizzero and that you found Kenny Brown, that really is the responsibility of the operator of the track, not the horse. You've done a great job of doing that, but it really is not your responsibility to maintain the track. It wasn't going to get done unless we did, quite frankly. So and then I, I would compliment you. I think the job you've done with the health of the backstretch workers and other stuff is just phenomenal. And I know I've read stories where you really did save lives. One guy basically had a terrible heart condition and probably would have killed over and died if you didn't have that service. So I would you know, commend you on that. And I have one question. Alan, you talked about um, synthetics and, and that's a popular. Does the MTHA have a position on that, an official position on no. that? The answer is now shake no. No. Uh, look, it, that's what I thought, it's a um, <clears throat> it, it's something that's in the forefront of the industry at large as a result of all that's happened this summer. It's a very uh, compelling argument. I think that the chair's intention is to have a session on synthetic surfaces to study it. I think there's a sense that that's the direction that the industry is going to go. Uh, at the end of the day, we cannot continue to afford to have horses that are breaking down and dying on our racetracks. It's not sustainable. No, and if, that is an, if that is a, an option, then we need to look at it very closely. But the MTHA, I mean, you were is not asking us to have a synthetic track at this point. We're studying it as an option. Okay. Our, no, I, I just, and, and it was a concept plan. If you, if you right, look yeah. at the original Laurel, so we're going to study it. We're going to have okay. it. We're so going to have it. We're going to have it. Right. And it's manufactured in Maryland. Mm. <laughs> it is. It's not going to be done. Who has a question? Nicole. 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 Oh, hi, Nicole. Let's unmute. I think you're on mute, Nicole. One. Oh, she's off now. No. no Can we open it? Can we take yeah. her off mute? She, I think. Yeah, she needs um star eight seven. Can you unmute yourself, Nicole?
Again, I need to. Everybody's muted on that. Is this working? Yes. yes. Good. Excellent. Good afternoon. And thank you so much for that presentation. Very informative, very enlightening. Learned a lot of great information. Wanted to ask a question about the housing components. What are your thoughts or about a strategy, how to deal, how, how we should think about the housing uh, uh, solution? And um, in terms of the need, how many housing units do you think would uh, fill the need? Well, currently right now we have, I don't have the numbers in front of me, we have about 100 people housed at uh, Pimlico currently, and about, I have to look at my numbers, about two, 250 or so housed at, um, at Laura. So regardless of whatever projects that moves forward, and I know we've gone through a lot of, a lot of uh, concepts, a lot of, you know, scenarios, and housing was always kind of pushed off, we'll deal with that later. That really has to be to the forefront because we can't operate a racetrack. There's no racetrack that doesn't operate in the country that doesn't have housing for backstretch workers. It's, it's a, it, it, this is really people's, this is their home. I've got people on the racetrack that have lived there since the 80s and the 90s. It, it's, it's really unbelievable how this community is, um, is people's homes. Um, so it has to be prioritized. Our workers, they, they don't need you know the 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 rich carlton um you know but they need basic ability to live their lives to be able to cook in their rooms to be able to have more than two electrical outlets to be able to have a refrigerator and a microwave in their room we really have to uh, focus on um did just you know humane housing for our workers so it has to be at the point of okay. this this project Other Thank questions? you. Other questions? All right, I want to thank I you. I have one. I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. I have one question. You should um, stop right in there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, uh, in reference to, okay, this is to the horse breeders and this concept about bringing stallions to Maryland <clears throat> with the permutations that are going on nationally for the past 18 years of a declining full crop. <laughs> how is this going to bring people to change this trend um and, and number two as far as the declining full crop how is that directly uh affecting racing it's like in a hotel business heads on bed you have to have heads on the beds if you're in the hotel business so that's two questions i have how would an incentive for spring stallions to maryland prop up what what the trend is showing declining full crop and then if if that can be solved uh in reference to the actual heads on bed horses at the racetrack tim that you train and that you so the stallion okay you go ahead so he's in the stallion business so let's so it's not just bringing stallions to Maryland. It, it's bring quality stallions to Maryland. And, and we can always bring stallions. We can get as many stallions as we want. <clears throat> but it's we need we need to upgrade the quality and we need to that'll in turn bring more mares. So if you have good stallions, that attracts better mares and more mares. Or less mares shipping to Kentucky. Yes. Right. So you're yeah, moving. There, there's yeah. a there's a you're large yeah mares. there's a large percentage of mares that go to Kentucky every year. There's people that I see seen on the phone that ship their their mares to Kentucky regularly. Um, so we need to keep those mares as many as possible in Maryland and attract new ones. And the better stallions are what would do that. And and that ties into more money because you need to offer the people who <clears throat> bring their mare to maryland to breed to this better stallion some incentive that that value that stud fee they will be able to recoup that in kentucky i mean i don't I mean i don't work there but there's a lot of incentives free stud fees even they'll pay for your shipping to kentucky things that maryland farms are not able to offer so if you're asking for a full stud fee advertised stud fee the people who pay that need to be able to have some confidence they can get that back either at the commercial level sell the horse at auction and recover that stud fee plus cost or in a racing opportunity that's the catch you have to make sure that people just because it's a good stallion 
somebody wants to know, okay, if I invest in that good stallion, I'm going to get my money somewhere down the road with that product. Um, and your second question, heads and beds. I can't. Uh, I mean, uh, I think that's part of it. I mean, it, it all comes down to dollars, in my opinion. Yeah. I'm a very small time breeder. Yeah. I don't know how frightfully expensive it is for me to yeah. even house them at my own farm and do everything. I mean, it's almost, you know, I, my wife asks me why. Why are we keep breeding these mares? It was his wife. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I but I'm just saying the model <laughs> would make sense. Yeah. Yeah. The voice uh, of reason almost. Yeah. But, I, but I, it's just, it's very difficult. From a, it's a dollars and cents. For but us. it's going down, Tim. Everything. But the, the trend is going. That's down. That's the jockey club. I mean, the national foal crop, um, Mr. Mooney. It's it's we if we can concentrate and keep a level in Maryland that is a production level that's good that works well for the racing industry for the for the incentive fund, but you can't, you know, we're battling against a national full crop that the jockey club is, the national jockey club, the stud book, the registry, don't, in my opinion, don't seem to be as concerned about as they should be, and we should be, because you have to offer people a way to make money, and, you know, I, I don't know, they're in charge of it, but it, you can't blame it all just on, on Maryland <laughs> dropping. It's it's national, and that's going to ultimately affect the racing product. There just will not be enough horses produced anywhere, or at least in this whole, you know, on the East Coast, to support multiple racetracks, unless you want to run four horse fields, which don't generate enough handle. You know, it's a vicious cycle. Or run fewer days, and that's what you'll have to do. Yeah. You just have to run fewer yeah. days. Okay. Thank you very much, guys, for your presentation. Other questions? Mary, have any? Alan, you mentioned uh, the lottery, and I understand how the lottery can help the Maryland racing, but how is it hurting it? Because I think, did you say that is currently hurting Maryland racing? Well, if somebody wants to bet on the racetracks game, we'd like them to be betting on horse racing. But if yeah. something is a product that is as similar, we should, because it's almost like intellectual property. It's something that is dependent to the uh, Maryland racing industry. Why would the state be putting up a product that the revenue from, you know, our product isn't going to our sport? Well, Mr. Industry. Mr. I've got a small business. I have racetracks and I have a small little OTB with that as well. The new betters will sit there and can literally go to the window at, at our business and, and bet on horse racing and look at the form. They'd rather, you know, many new betters that you're introducing to the game would rather sit and watch the cartoon horse racing because it's simple, it's easy, it's, you quick. know, it's something they it's can quick. understand, it's, it's quick. Yeah. You'll be amazed at how many people will sit there and play racetracks when they can literally bet on the third race tomorrow. Um, so it, it's a competitor. I mean, it, it literally is actively competing with our betting dollar. They'd rather do the, do the, the cartoon horse racing then. Yeah, and you'll be amazed at how many people stand around this cartoon <laughs> race track that scream and yell like it's a horse race. Yeah. And, it's and they've got horse racing right beside it. Yeah. It's you can, unbelievable. You, it's can see, you, can, you can go back in history and look at the decline. You know, when the lottery was legalized in Maryland in the 1970s, yeah. the only way you could gamble in Maryland was to go to the racetrack. And that's why racing yeah, at that time was so popular. Yeah. Once you gave them another option, and as that's, that's continued to grow with the LTs and with sports betting, the urge to go to the racetrack and gamble isn't there because there's so many other options that they have. Even, you know, we've had to embrace, we we're the first ones to embrace the phone, the television. Mm -hmm. We were carved out as an exception under federal law, but all that's now changed. We're, we're in a very competitive environment right now. We have to find our place in that environment. So having a game about horse racing that the state is running that's competing with us makes no sense. And there are ways, there's creative ways that you can join them together. You know, you can do joint branding and ways that you can incorporate our images, our brand into that racetrack that actually encourages, it, it's a great tool. I don't want to say let's get rid of it. It's a fantastic tool because it introduces someone that knows nothing about horse racing to horse racing. But we can actually be creative in a way that that funnels them and turns them into active customers. And that, that's important. It's really important. Yeah. And I think there are ways that, you know, working with an engaged partner that we can we can do. We, we can explore those things. Uh, like I said, even the ADW, you know, uh, Stronic Group runs a very successful ADW. Uh, but literally, we have people that will sit at the racetrack and, and our revenue from an ADW is minuscule. As opposed to if you go to a uh, to a window and place a bet, 
where the breeders, the horsemen, we receive a lot more of that revenue. But you'll be amazed at how many people would rather sit and bet on their phone at the racetrack. And, right. and our revenue, the Very horsemen and breeders, it, it, it's it's tiny. We've been pushing the initiative that any any bet on ADW in Maryland should be treated as just like you're going to the window. Right. So that's a huge revenue you know, resource that we can tap if we had an engaged operator that could help us solve those challenges. But they haven't because it doesn't benefit them because they operate Absolutely. the ADW. So we should have our own Maryland ADW that we encourage that also has sports betting on it that that you know encourages new customers and you know your your um your people that that you know wager on their phone should also be easily you know able to wager on horse racing and it be a live bet that Marylanders benefit from. So there's a lot of things that we can do. So. So sorry, that was a long-winded no, answer sorry. to your question. But. Is there any reason Maryland can't impose that actually as a tax? No, there's not. There's not. And I think that's, that's some things that. So then we're your partner, your yeah. engaged partner. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> any bet within Maryland should be a live bet, and whether it's bet on the phone, yeah. whether it's bet, however, and, you know, whether it's bet going through Fanduel. Now Fanduel, you know, actually the markets are horse racing that you can bet on horse racing on their phone. But we the, or the revenue that. Maryland receives out of that is is minuscule. Well, yeah. well, thank you all. Really, thanks for your time. Thanks for answering all the questions. Thank you. Yep. I, 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 I have a I have a I have a question. Can you who hear is, me? Who, who, yes, we can hear you. No, 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 wait, 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 wait. Who is this? Yeah. Hi, my name is Bill Reitler. I'm a lifelong right? Maryland. Yeah, we're not we're not having public questions. We're gonna have public comment in just a minute, but no oh. public questions. Okay, so, thank you. Sorry. That's okay. Thank you, Walt. Thank you. Thanks for letting us. You can make stick our around case. or not. Sure, if you're tall. Oh, I want to stick around. Right? <laughs> I want to hear public <laughs> comments. All right, do, um, do people need a break or do we want to take public comment and then take a break? A quick break, me. Take five, right, five minutes. Okay. Five minutes. Um, um, you have to Yeah, I know you're fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm Oh my God, yeah, my whole family's been happy. Really? Yeah. No, no, when I heard you were from Darlington, I thought, yeah. Harper County and oh my God! Oh, um, it's actually so Darlington. Right. So if you go up 161, right. you make it right on Price Road, which is a little road of dangerous making that right. And go to the end of it and make a right, and we're right there. I might, I might take you up on yeah. some yeah. by. You should. I've been to yeah. plenty oh, yeah, of breeding days. operations in my time, but I, I would love to see your place. Yeah, Harper yeah, that would be good. I know a lot about some people can't see my
can we go back on the line? Okay. This is the period for public comment. Um, we generally ask that you keep it to no more than a couple of minutes. Um, so if anyone has a comment, please raise your hand. We'll call and, 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 we, and we'll unmute you and identify you. Hi, Bill Reitler. Hi, Bill. Hi, how are you all this afternoon? Uh, excellent presentation. Excellent presentation. I think everybody did a great job identifying the problems. Um, I'm a lifelong Marylander, uh, participated in every facet of the business. I'm one of the leading bloodstock agents and consigners at all the horse sales in Maryland. Uh, the one thing that we really haven't heard, and I think shouldn't we put our business on its entire is doing a miserable job is promotion and uh you know focusing money on how do we get the new people in the business how do we attract new betters um we don't we don't spend enough money on that we advertise in the house we don't really do very much outside of our industry uh to attract thanks thank you other comments Yes, could I have, I'm on a phone, I'm not able to raise my hand. But this no, is that's Michael okay, Harrison. just identify yourself, please. Yeah, this is Dr. Michael Harrison speaking. I'm a practicing equine veterinarian, have been doing that for over 40 years, past president of Maryland Horse Breeders Association, current board member. And uh, I just wanted to say a few words about the general airs of racing right now and conditions we have. Uh, Public trust, the social license to breed, raise, and race horses is seriously weakening right now. Uh, currently, we have FISA, which is the Horse Racing Integrity Safety Act agency, and its arms are very important more than ever now. And But some people do feel that the restraint that those arms uh, affect can be a lethal chokehold. Uh, and yet the negative image of breakdown clusters continues to appear. We've seen that and you've heard this earlier in the presentations about what occurred at Laurel, what happened at, at Churchill, and uh, what has also happened more recently up at Saratoga. Oversimplification and single factor explanations miss the reality that it is the cumulative wear and tear in race training that crescendos into the breakdown event. Genetics, diet, training methods, practices, racing surface, medication, ignorance, and greed all contribute to this. We Marylanders have a unique opportunity to go beyond all that is currently being investigated to create a new training and racing facility designed to allow the collection of relevant data affecting racing safety. This should include conditions affecting the racing surface, training methods, and medical histories. Researching gate analysis systems could be integrated with the data collected and the processing of all information could then be analyzed using, using artificial intelligence. A vision and planning is essential, but Maryland could be the leader that could eventually save racing and bring it to new heights and success. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you for your comment. Anyone else? Well, thank you all. We've been getting great attendance for these meetings. I hope that uh, they're fulfilling, making it worth your time. Oh. Hello? Yes. Who is speaking? Um, it's Tavy Black. Um, I'm a trainer, farm owner in Maryland, former president of the Maryland Horse Breeders. I just have one comment. When you were talking about um, more money, and I think you were confused that we were saying we didn't want more money. What they were saying is that instead of 80 days at 600,000 a day, we would prefer 100 and whatever, 40 or at 400. It, it, it obviously, we'd like more money, but given the money we have, what we're trying to say is that it's better for our industry it's a less money per day over more days 
because that's more opportunities for the horses to run. It's the same amount of money in the end, but more of it would go to Maryland people. All right, thank you. Okay. Thanks. Any other comments? All right, thank you. We're going to end the public comment, but thank you all for attending. And our next meeting is on October 20th, where we're we're planning to talk about horse health. How are we doing on our agenda? We're good. Alan and I were. Yeah, good. Um, that should be very interesting. Um, Alan's helping to coordinate the people who are going to speak. Um, we're going to, we need to move into executive session now. Um, and we're going to, we're going into executive session because of Maryland 3305B15 to discuss technology issues. So, um, can I get a motion to move to executive session? A second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Put my group to sleep. Anyone opposed? We have unanimous. All right. Thank you all. We'll clear the room. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.